Chapter forty three, part two of Struggles and Triumphs, or Forty Years Recollections of P. T. Barnum, written by himself. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Struggles and Triumphs of P. T. Barnum, Chapter forty three, The New Museum, part two but before this plan could be put into effective operation an event occurred which is now to be narrated the winter of eighteen sixty seven sixty eight was one of the coldest that had been known for years and some thirty severe snowstorms occurred during the season on tuesday morning march third eighteen sixty eight it was bitter cold a heavy body of snow was on the ground and as i sat at the breakfast table with my wife and an esteemed lady guest the wife of my excellent friend rev a c thomas i read aloud the general news from the morning papers leisurely turning to the local columns i said hello barnum's museum is burned yes said my wife with an incredulous smile i suspect it is it is a fact said i just listen barnum's museum totally destroyed by fire this was read so coolly and i showed so little excitement that both of the ladies supposed i was joking my wife simply remarked yes it was totally destroyed two years ago but barnum built another one yes and that is burned i replied now listen and i proceeded very calmly to read the account of the fire mrs thomas still believing from my manner that it was a joke stole slyly behind my chair and looking over my shoulder at the newspaper she exclaimed why mrs barnum the museum is really burned here is the whole account of it in this morning's paper of course it is i remarked with a smile how could you think i could joke on such a serious subject it was indeed too true and the subject was no doubt serious enough in fact the pecuniary blow was perhaps even heavier than the loss of the other museum especially as there was probably no bennett around who would give me two hundred thousand dollars for a lease but during my whole life i had been so accustomed to operations of magnitude for or against my interests that large losses or gains were not apt to disturb my tranquillity indeed my second daughter calling in soon after and seeing how coolly i took the disaster said that her husband had remarked that morning your father won't care half so much about it as he would if his pocket had been picked of fifty dollars that would have vexed him but he will take this heavier loss as simply the fortune of war and this was very nearly the fact yet the loss was a large one and the complete frustration of our plans for the future was a serious consideration but worse than all were the sufferings of the poor wild animals which were burned to death in their cages a very few only of these animals were saved even the people who were sleeping in the building barely escaped with their lives and next to nothing else so sudden was the fire and so rapid its progress the papers of the following morning contained full accounts of the fire and editorial writers while manifesting much sympathy for the proprietors also expressed profound regret that so magnificent a collection especially in the zoological department should be lost to the city the cold was so intense that the water froze almost as soon as it left the hose of the fire engines and when at last everything was destroyed except the front granite wall of the museum building that and the ladder signs and lamp posts in front were covered in a gorgeous framework of transparent ice which made it altogether one of the most picturesque scenes imaginable thousands of persons congregated daily in that locality in order to get a view of the magnificent ruins by moonlight the ice-coated ruins were still more sublime and for many days and nights the old museum was the observed of all observers and photographs were taken by several artists when the museum was burnt i was nearly ready to bring out a new spectacle for which a very large company had been engaged and on which a considerable sum of money had been expended in scenery properties costumes and especially in enlarging the stage i had expended altogether some seventy eight thousand dollars in building the new lecture room and in refitting the saloons the curiosities were inventoried by the manager mr ferguson at two hundred and eighty eight thousand dollars 
i bought the real estate only a little before the fire for four hundred and sixty thousand dollars and there was an insurance on the whole of a hundred and sixty thousand dollars and in june eighteen sixty eight i sold the lots on which the building stood for four hundred and thirty two thousand dollars the cause of the fire was a defective flue in a restaurant in the basement of the building thus by the destruction of iranistan and two museums about a million of dollars worth of my property had been destroyed by fire and i was not now long in making up my mind to follow mr greeley's advice on a former occasion to take this fire as a notice to quit and go a-fishing we all know how difficult it is for a person to stop when he is engaged in business and how seldom it is that we find a man who thinks he has accumulated money enough and is willing to cease trying to make more an active business life like everything else becomes a habit and the strife for success in business through all the changes of fortune and ups and downs of trade becomes an infatuation akin to that which spurs the gambler hence men often pursue their money-getting occupations long after the necessity therefore has ceased of course by wedding themselves to this one ambition they forego many of the higher pleasures of life and though they have a vague idea of that good time coming when they are going to take things easy and enjoy themselves that time never comes men who are entirely idle are the most miserable creatures in the world but when by arduous toil they have secured a competence and especially when they have reached a point in life when they are conscious of a waning of their vital energies we must admit that they are unwise if they do not slip out of active business and devote a large portion of their time to intellectual pursuits social enjoyments and if they have not done so through life to serious reflections on the ends and aims of human existence it is perhaps possible that notwithstanding the active life i have led i have after all a lazy streak in my composition at all events i confess that it was with no small degree of satisfaction that by this last burning of the museum notwithstanding the serious pecuniary loss it proved to me i discovered a way open through which i could retire to a more quiet and tranquil mode of life i therefore at once dissolved with the van amberg company and sold out to them all my interest in the personal property of the concern i was however beset on every side to start another museum and men of capital offered to raise a million of dollars if necessary for that purpose provided i would undertake its management my constant reply was lead me not into temptation i felt that i had enough to live on and i earnestly believed the doctrine laid down in my lecture on money-getting in regard to the danger of leaving too much property to children as i now had something like real leisure at my disposal in the summer of eighteen sixty eight i made my third visit to the white mountains to me the locality and scene are ever fresh and ever wonderful from the top of mount washington one can see on every side within a radius of forty miles peaks piled on peaks with smiling valleys here and there between and on a very clear day the atlantic ocean off portland maine is distinctly visible sixty miles away beauty grandeur sublimity and the satisfaction of almost every sense combine to remind one of the ejaculation of that devout english soul who exclaims look around with pleasure and upward with gratitude at the profile house near the notch in the franconia range i met many acquaintances some of whom had been there with their families for several weeks when tired of scenery hunting and hill climbing and thrown entirely upon their own resources they had invented a cell which they perpetrated upon every newcomer naturally enough as i was considered a capital subject for their fun before i had been there half an hour they had made all the arrangements to take me in the cell consisted in getting up a foot race in which all were to join and at the word go the contestants were to start and run across the open space in front of the hotel to a fence opposite while the last man who should touch the rail must treat the crowd of course no one touched the rail at all except the victim i suspected no trick but tried to avoid the race urging an excuse that i was too old too corpulent and besides as they knew i was a teetotaler and would not drink their liquor oh drink lemonade if you like they said but no backing out and as for corpulence 
here is stephen our old stage driver who weighs three hundred and he shall run with the rest and in good truth stephen on a warm day especially would be likely to run with the best of them but i did not know then that stephen was the stool pigeon whom they kept to entrap unwary and verdant youths like myself so looking at his portly form i at once agreed that if stephen ran i would as i knew that for a stout man i was pretty quick on my feet accordingly at the word go i started and ran as if the traditional enemy of mankind were in me or after me but before i had accomplished half the distance i wondered why at least one or two of the crowd had not outstripped me for in fact stephen was the only one whom i expected to beat looking back and at once comprehending the sell i decided not to be sold a correspondent of the new york sun told how i escaped the trick and the penalty and how i subsequently paid off the tricksters in a letter from which i quote the following barnum threw up his hands before arriving at the railing and did not touch it at all it was acknowledged on all sides that the biters were bit but you ran well said those who intended the sell yes replied barnum in high glee i ran better than i did for congress but i was not green enough to touch the rail of course a roar of laughter followed and the sellers resolved to try the game the next morning on some other newcomer but their luck had evidently deserted them for the next man also smelt a rat and holding up his hands refused to touch the rail the two successive failures dampened the ardor of the sellers and they relinquished that trick as a bad job but the way barnum sold nearly the whole crowd of sellers in detail on the following afternoon by the old sliver trick was a caution to sore sides so much laughing in one day was probably never before done in that locality one after another succeeded in extracting from the palm of barnum's hand what each at first supposed was a tormenting sliver but which turned out to be a broom splinter a foot long which was hidden up b s sleeve except the small point which appeared from under the end of his thumb apparently protruding from under the skin of his palm one weak brother nearly fainted as he saw come forth some twelve inches of what he had first supposed was a sliver but which he was now thoroughly convinced was one of the nerves from barnum's arm mr o'brien the wall street banker was the first victim when asked what he thought upon seeing such a long sliver coming from barnum's hand he solemnly replied i thought he was a dead man it was acknowledged by all that barnum gave them a world of fun and that he and his friends left the profile house with flying colors during the year mr george wood a most successful and enterprising manager had been engaged in enlarging and refitting banvard's building on the corner of broadway and thirteenth street for a museum and theatre and wishing to avoid my competition in the business he proposed that for a consideration to be governed to some degree by the receipts i should bind myself to have no other interest in any museum or place of amusement in new york and that i should give him the benefit of my experience influence and information and thus aid in advancing his interests and in building up and carrying out his enterprise his proposition fully met my views and i accepted it without incurring risk or responsibility i could occupy portions of my time which otherwise perhaps might drag heavily on my hands my mind especially would be employed in matters with which i was familiar and i might gratify my desire to assist in catering to the healthful wholesome amusement of the rising generation and the public i should not rust out and moreover the new museum would afford me a pleasant place to drop into when i felt inclined to do so nothing in this arrangement compelled my presence in new york or even in the united states i could go when and where i chose and could continue to be as i hoped to be for the rest of my life a man of leisure which in my case and according to my construction is far from being a man of idleness while i was at the white mountains i received a telegram from mr george wood stating that he could not consider his list of curiosities complete unless i would consent to be present at the opening of his museum and i accordingly waived all my chances in any intended foot races and hastened to new york making at mr wood's request the opening address in his new establishment august thirty first eighteen sixty eight 
End of chapter 43, part 2. Chapter 44 of Struggles and Triumphs, or Forty Years' Recollections of P. T. Barnum, written by himself. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gary B. Clayton. Struggles and Triumphs of P. T. Barnum, Chapter 44, Curious Incidences, Number 13. In the summer of 1868, a lady who happened to be at that time an inmate of my family, upon hearing me say that I suppose we must remove into our summer residence on Thursday, because our servants might not like to go on Friday, remarked, Whatever nonsense that is! It is astonishing that some persons are so foolish as to think there is any difference in the days. I call it rank heathenism to be so superstitious as to think one day is lucky and another unlucky and then, in the most innocent manner possible, she added, I would not like to remove on a Saturday myself, for they say people who remove on the last day of the week don't stay long. Of course, this was too refreshing a case of undoubted superstition to be permitted to pass without a hearty laugh from all who heard it. I suppose most of us have certain superstitions, imbibed in our youth, and still lurking more or less faintly in our minds many would not like to acknowledge that they had any choice whether they commenced a new enterprise on a friday or on a monday or whether they first saw the new moon over the right or left shoulder and yet perhaps a large portion of these same persons will be apt to observe it when they happen to do anything which popular superstition calls unlucky it is a common occurrence with many to immediately make a secret wish if they happen to use the same expression at the same moment when a friend with whom they are conversing makes it. Nevertheless, these persons would protest against being considered superstitious. Indeed, probably they are not so in the full meaning of the word. Several years ago, an old lady who was a guest at my house remarked on a rainy Sunday, This is the first Sunday in the month and now it will rain every sunday in the month that is a sign which never fails for i have noticed it many a time well i remarked smiling watch closely this time and if it rains on the next three sundays i will give you a new silk dress she was in high glee and replied well you have lost that dress as sure as you are born the following sunday it did indeed rain aha exclaimed the old lady what did i tell you i knew it would rain I smiled and said, all right, watch for next Sunday. And surely enough, the next Sunday it did rain, harder than on either of the preceding Sundays. Now, what do you think, said the old lady solemnly? I tell you that sign never fails. It won't do to doubt the ways of providence, she added with a sigh, for his ways are mysterious and past finding out. The following Sunday the sun rose in a cloudless sky, and not the slightest appearance of rain was manifested throughout the day. The old lady was greatly disappointed and did not like to hear any allusion to the subject. But two years afterwards, when she was once more my guest, it again happened to rain on the first Sunday in the month, and I heard her solemnly predict that it would, every succeeding Sunday in the month, for she remarked, It is a sign that never fails. She had forgotten the failure of two years before. Indeed, the continuance and prevalence of many popular superstitions is due to the fact that we notice the sign when it happens to be verified, and do not observe it or we forget it when it fails. Many persons are exceedingly superstitious in regard to the number 13. This is particularly the case, I have noticed, in Catholic countries I have visited, and I have been told that superstition originated in the fact of a 13th apostle having been chosen on account of the treachery of judas at any rate i have known numbers of french persons who have quite a horror of this fatal number once i knew a french lady who had taken passage in an ocean steamer and who on going on board and finding herself assigned stateroom to be number thirteen insisted upon it that she would not sail in the ship at all she had rather forfeit her passage money though finally she was persuaded to take another room and a great many people, French, English, and American, will not undertake any important enterprise on the thirteenth day of the month, nor sit at table with the full complement of thirteen persons. 
With regard to this number to which so many superstitions cling, I have some interesting experiences and curious coincidences which are worth relating as part of my personal history. When I was first in England with General Tom Thumb, I well remember dining one Christmas day with my friends, the Brettles, in St. James Palace in London. Just before the dinner was finished, it is a wonder it was not noticed before, it was discovered that the number at table was exactly thirteen. How unfortunate, remarked one of the guests. I would not have dined under such circumstances for any consideration had I known it. Nor I either, seriously remarked another guest. Do you really suppose there is any truth in the old superstition on that subject? I asked. Truth, solemnly replied an old lady. Truth? Why, I myself have known three instances and have heard of scores of others where thirteen persons have eaten at the same table, and in every case one of the number died before the year was out. This assertion, made with so much earnestness, evidently affected several of the guests whose nerves were easily excited. I can truthfully state, however, that I dined at the palace again the following Christmas, and although there were seventeen persons present, every one of the original thirteen who dined there the preceding Christmas was among this number, and all in good health. Although, of course, it would have been nothing very remarkable if one had happened to have died during the last twelve months. While I was on my western lecturing tour in 1866, long before I got out of Illinois, I began to observe that at the various hotels where I stopped, my room very frequently was number 13. Indeed, it seemed as if this number turned up to me as often as four times per week, and so before many days I almost expected to have that number set down to my name wherever I signed it upon the register of the hotel. Still, I laughed to myself at what I was convinced was simply a coincidence. On one occasion I was traveling from Clinton to Mount Vernon, Iowa, and was to lecture in the college of the latter place that evening. Ordinarily, I should have arrived at 2 o'clock p.m., but owing to an accident which had occurred to the train from the west, the conductor informed me that our arrival in Mount Vernon would probably be delayed until after 7 o'clock. I telegraphed that fact to the committee who were expecting me and told them to be patient. When we had arrived within 10 miles of that town, it was dark. I sat rather moodily in the car, wishing the train would hurry up and happening for some cause to look back over my left shoulder, I discovered the new moon through the window. This omen struck me as a coincident addition to my ill luck, and with a pleasant chuckle I muttered to myself, Well, I hope I won't get room number 13 tonight, for that will be adding insult to injury. I reached Mount Vernon a few minutes before eight, and was met at the depot by the committee, who took me in a carriage and hurried to the Ballard House. The committee told me the hall in the college was already crowded, and they hoped I would defer taking tea until after the lecture. I informed them that I would gladly do so, but simply wished to run to my room a moment for a wash. While wiping my face, I happened to think about the new room, and at once stepped outside my bedroom door to look at the number. It was number 13. After the lecture, I took tea, and I confess that I began to think number 13 looked a little ominous. There I was, many hundreds of miles from my family. I left my wife sick, and I began to ask myself, does number 13 portend anything in particular? Without feeling willing even now to acknowledge that I felt much apprehension on the subject, I must say I began to take a serious view of things in general. I mentioned the coincidence of my luck in so often having number 13 assigned to me to Mr. Ballard, the proprietor of the hotel, giving him all the particulars to date. I will give you another room if you prefer it, said Mr. Boward. No, I thank you, I replied with a semi-serious smile. If it is fate, I will take it as it comes. And if it means anything, I shall probably find it out in time. That same night before retiring to rest, I wrote a letter to a clerical friend then residing in Bridgeport, telling him all my experiences in regard to number 13. I said to him in closing, Don't laugh at me for being superstitious, for I hardly feel so. I think it is simply a series of coincidences which appear the more strange because I am sure to notice every one that occurs. Ten days afterwards, I received an answer from my reverend friend in which he cheerfully said, Go, it's all right. Go ahead and get number 13 as often as you can. It is a lucky number. And he added, 
unbelieving and ungrateful man what is thirteen but the traditional baker's dozen indicating good measure pressed down shaken together and running over as illustrated in your triumphal lecturing tour by all means insist upon having room number thirteen at every hotel and if the guests at any meal be less than that charmed compliment send out and compel somebody to come in what do you say respecting the thirteen colonies any ill luck in that number was the patriarch jacob afraid of it when he adopted ephraim and manasseh the two sons of joseph and so as to complete the magic circle of thirteen do you not know that chapter thirteen of first corinthians is the grandest in the bible with verse thirteen as the culmination of all religious thought and can you read verse thirteen of the fifth chapter of revelation without the highest rapture but my clerical friend had not heard of a certain curious circumstance which occurred to me after i had mailed my letter to him and before i received his answer on leaving mount vernon for cedar rapids the next morning the landlord mr ballard drove me to the railroad depot as i was stepping upon the cars mr ballard shook my hand and with a laugh exclaimed good-bye friend barnum i hope you won't get room number thirteen at cedar rapids to-day i hope not i replied earnestly and yet with a smile i reached cedar rapids in an hour the lecture committee met and took me to the hotel i entered my name and the landlord immediately called out to the porter here john take mr barnum's baggage and show him to number thirteen i confess that when i heard this i was startled i remarked to the landlord that it was certainly very singular but was nevertheless true that number thirteen seemed to be about the only room that i could get in a hotel we have a large meeting of railroad directors here at present he replied and number thirteen is the only room unoccupied in my house i proceeded to the room and immediately wrote to mr ballard at mount vernon assuring him that my letter was written in number thirteen and that this was the only room i could get in the hotel during the remainder of my journey i was put into number thirteen so often in the various hotels at which i stopped that it came to be quite a matter of course though occasionally i was fortunate enough to secure some other number upon returning to new york i related the foregoing adventures to my family and told them i was really half afraid of number thirteen soon afterwards i telegraphed to my daughter who was boarding at the atlantic house in bridgeport asking her to engage a room for me to lodge there the next night on my way to boston mr hale she said to the landlord father is coming up to-day will you please reserve for him a comfortable room certainly replied mr hale and he instantly ordered a fire in room thirteen i went to boston and proceeded to lewiston maine and thence to lawrence massachusetts and the hotel register there has my name booked for number thirteen my experience with this number has by no means been confined to apartments in eighteen sixty seven a church in bridgeport wanted to raise several thousand dollars in order to get freed from debt i subscribed one thousand dollars by aid of which they assured me they would certainly raise enough to pay off the debt a few weeks subsequently however one of the brethren wrote me that they were still six hundred dollars short with but little prospect of getting it i replied that i would pay one half the sum required the brother soon afterwards wrote to me that he had obtained the other half and i might forward him my subscription of thirteen hundred dollars during the same season i attended a fair in franklin hall bridgeport given by a temperance organization two of my little granddaughters accompanied me and telling them to select what articles they desired i paid the bill twelve dollars and fifty cents whereupon i said to the children i am glad you did not make it thirteen dollars and i will expend no more here to-night we sat a while listening to the music and finally started for home and as we were going a lady at one of the stands near the door called out mr barnum you have not patronized me please take a chance in my lottery certainly i replied give me a ticket i paid her the price fifty cents and after i arrived home i discovered that in spite of my expressed determination to the contrary i had expended exactly thirteen dollars i invited a few friends to a clam bake in the summer of eighteen sixty eight and being determined the party should not be thirteen i invited fifteen and they all agreed to go of course one man and his wife were disappointed and could not go and my party numbered thirteen at christmas in the same year 
my children and grandchildren dined with me and finding on counting noses that they would number the inevitable thirteen i expressly arranged to have a high chair placed at the table and my youngest grandchild seventeen months old was placed in it so that we should number fourteen after the dinner was over we discovered that my son-in-law thompson had been detained downtown and the number at dinner table notwithstanding my extra precautions was exactly thirteen thirteen was certainly an ominous number to me in eighteen sixty five for on the thirteenth day of july the american museum was burned to the ground while on the thirteenth day of november saw the opening of barnum's new american museum which was also subsequently destroyed by fire having concluded this veritable history of superstitious coincidences in regard to thirteen i read it to a clerical friend who happened to be present and after reading the manuscript i paged it when my friend and i were a little startled to find out that the pages numbered exactly thirteen end of chapter forty four recording by gary b clayton Chapter 45, Part 1 of Struggles and Triumphs, or Forty Years' Recollections of P.T. Barnum. Written by himself. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Struggles and Triumphs of p t barnum chapter forty five a story chapter part one and now as a traveller when almost home sits down by the wayside to rest and meanwhile discourses to his companion about minor matters relating to the journey or revives reminiscences of home and foreign lands so i stop to sum up in this chapter some of the incidences and anecdotes which seem pertinent to my story old adages every man to his vocation and nature will assert herself are oftentimes amusingly illustrated every one knows the fable of the man who prayed to jupiter to convert his cat into a woman and jupiter kindly gratified him and the man married the woman this was well enough till one night the feline female heard a mouse's scratching at the door when she jumped out of the bed and began a vigorous hunt to the consternation of her husband if not of the mouse something almost ab something almost as absurd and quite as illustrative of instinct or nature occurred during my management of the museum i had brought out a play entitled the patriot fathers or something of the sort it was patriotic at any rate and required a great many people who had very little to do excepting to dress group themselves and go on and off the stage at the proper times demanded by the incidents or situations of the play one night i suddenly found myself short of supernumeraries to do these subordinate parts so i sent up to centre market for a supply of young men who were willing to be soldiers indians or anything else which the exigencies of the revolutionary times not less than my own immediate necessities demanded now it fortunately happened that an engine company near by the famous forty of gone bygone days had just returned from a fire and my messenger proposed to these men to come down and help me out of my difficulty the boys wanted no better fun at least thirty of them came headed by their foreman mr william racy they were soon dressed one as a woman a mother of the revolution others as indians british soldiers hessian grenadiers and continentals a very little drilling sufficed to put these new recruits in order for presentation on the stage for they had little to do but to follow directions as to where they must stand and when they must go on and off 
numbers not talent were needed they were apt pupils and did excellently well from the start but in the very midst of one of those convulsions which threatened the fate of the struggle for independence the city hall bell sounded out the alarm for fire that was enough racy shouted out on the stage boys there's a fire in the seventh put four forty and the thirty incontinently fled in post haste for forty and soon after appeared in the street followed by a jeering cheering crew the most motley company that ever dragged a fire engine through the streets of new york they were in full costume as they left the museum the red-coated british troops the hessians in their tall bearskin caps the indians in their paint and feathers and even the woman helped to drag the machine and at the fire these strange people including the woman helped to man the brakes it is unnecessary to say that they succeeded in creating in the street what i hoped they would have done on the stage a positive sensation i confess i am fond of story-telling as well as fun and i inherit this i think from my maternal grandfather whom i have already chronicled in these pages as a practical joker of the old school one of the best illustrations of his peculiar fondness for this amusement appears in the following danbury and bethel were and still are manufacturing villages hats and combs were the principal articles of manufacture the hatters and comb makers had occasion to go to new york every spring and fall and they generally managed to go in parties frequently taking in a few outsiders who merely wished to visit the city for the fun of the thing they usually took passage on board a sloop at norwalk and the length of their passage depended entirely upon the state of the wind sometimes the run would be made in eight hours and at other times nearly as many days were required it however made little difference with the passengers they were in for a spree and were sure to have a jolly time whether on land or water they were all fond of practical jokes and before starting they usually entered into a solemn compact that any man who got angry at a practical joke should forfeit and pay the sum of twenty dollars this agreement frequently saved much trouble for occasionally an unsuspected and rather severe trick would be played off and sadly chafe the temper of the victim upon one of these occasions a party of fourteen men started from bethel on a monday morning for new york among the number were my grandfather captain noah ferry benjamin hoyt esq uncle samuel taylor as he was called by everybody a leisure taylor and charles dart most of these were proverbial jokers and it was doubly necessary to adopt the stipulation in regard to the control of temper it was therefore done in writing duly signed they arrived at norwalk monday afternoon the sloop set sail the same evening with a fair prospect of reaching new york early the next morning several strangers took passage at norwalk among the rest a clergyman he soon found himself in jolly company and attempted to keep aloof but they informed him it was of no use they expected to reach new york the next morning and were determined to make a night of it so he might as well render himself agreeable for sleep was out of the question his reverence remonstrated at first and talked about his rights but he soon learned that he was in a company where the rights of the majority were in the ascendant so he put a smooth face upon affairs and making up his mind 
not to retire that night he soon engaged in conversation with several of his fellow passengers the clergyman was a slim spare man standing over six feet high in his stockings of light complexion sandy hair and wearing a huge pair of reddish-brown whiskers some of the passengers joked him upon the superfluity of hair upon his face but he replied that nature had placed it there and although he thought proper in accordance with modern custom to shave off a portion of his beard he considered it neither unmanly nor unclerical to wear whiskers it seemed to be conceded that the clergyman had the best of the argument and the subject was changed expectation of a speedy run to new york was most sadly disappointed the vessel appeared scarcely to move and through long weary hours of day and night there was not a ripple on the surface of the water nevertheless there was merriment on board the sloop each voyager contributing good humor to beguile the tediousness of time friday morning came but the calm continued five days from home and no prospect of reaching new york we may judge the appearance of the beards of the passengers there was but one razor in the company it was owned by my grandfather and he refused to use it or to suffer it to be used we shall all be shaved in new york said he on saturday morning all hands appeared upon deck and the sloop was becalmed opposite saw pits now port chester this tried the patience of the passengers sadly i expected to start for home to-day said one i suppose all my combs would have been sold at auction on wednesday and yet here they are on board said another i intended to have sold my hat surely this week for i have a note to pay in new haven on monday added a third i have an appointment to preach in new york this evening and to-morrow said the clergyman whose huge sandy whiskers overshadowed a face now completely covered with a bright red beard a quarter of an inch long well there is no use crying gentlemen replied the captain it is lucky for us that we have chickens and eggs on freight or we might have to be put upon allowance after breakfast the passengers who now began to look like barbarians again solicited the loan of my grandfather's razor no gentlemen he replied i insist that shaving is unhealthy and contrary to nature and i am determined neither to shave myself nor loan my razor until we reach new york night came and yet no wind sunday morning found them in the same position their patience was well nigh exhausted but after breakfast a slight ripple appeared it gradually increased and the passengers were soon delighted in seeing the anchor weighed and the sails again set the sloop glided finely through the water and smiles of satisfaction forced themselves through the swamps of bristles which covered the faces of the passengers what time shall we reach new york if this breeze continues was the anxious inquiry of half a dozen passengers about two o'clock this afternoon replied the good-natured captain who now felt assured that no calm would further blight his prospects alas that will be too late to get shaved exclaimed several voices the barber shops close at twelve and i shall barely be in time to preach my afternoon sermon responded red-bearded clergyman mr taylor do be so kind as to loan me your shaving utensils he continued addressing my grandfather the old gentleman then went to his trunk and unlocking it he drew forth his razor lather box and strop the passengers pressed around him 
as all were now doubly anxious for a chance to shave themselves now gentlemen said my grandfather i will be fair with you i did not intend to lend my razor but as we shall arrive too late for the barbers you shall all use it but it is evident we cannot all have time to be shaved with one razor before we reach new york and as it would be hard for half of us to walk on shore with clean faces and leave the rest on board waiting for their turn to shave themselves i have hit upon a plan which i am sure you will all say is just and equitable what is it was the anxious inquiry it is that each man shall shave one half of his face and pass the razor over to the next and when we are all half shaved we shall go on in rotation shave the other half they all agreed to this except the clergyman he objected to appearing so ridiculous upon the lord's day whereupon several declared that any man with such enormous reddish whiskers must necessarily always look ridiculous and they insisted that if the clergyman used the razor at all he should shave off his whiskers my grandfather assented to this proposal and said now gentlemen as i own the razor i will begin and as our reverend friend is in a hurry he shall be next but off shall come one of his whiskers on the first turn or he positively shall not use my razor at all the clergyman seeing there was no use in parleying reluctantly agreed to the proposition in the course of ten minutes one side of my grandfather's face and chin in a straight line from the middle of his nose was shaved as close as the back of his hand while the other looked like a thick brush fence in a country swamp the passengers burst into a roar of laughter in which the clergyman irresistibly joined and my grandfather handed the razor to the clerical gentleman the clergyman had already well lathered one half of his face and passed the brush to the next customer in a short time the razor had performed its work and the clergyman was denuded of one whisker the left side of his face was as naked as that of an infant while from the other cheek four inches of a huge red whisker stood out in powerful contrast nothing more ludicrous could well be conceived a deafening burst of laughter ensued and the poor clergyman sunk quietly away to wait an hour until his turn should arrive to shave the other portion of his face the next man went through the same operation and all the rest followed a new laugh breaking forth as each customer handed over the razor to the next in turn in the course of an hour and a quarter every passenger on board was half shaved it was then proposed that all should go upon the deck and take a drink before operations were commenced on the other side of their faces when they all gathered upon the deck the scene was most ludicrous the whole party burst again into loud merriment each man being convulsed by the ridiculous appearance of the rest now gentlemen said my grandfather i will go into the cabin and shave off the other side you can all remain on deck as soon as i have finished i will come up and give the clergyman the next chance you must hurry or you will not all be finished when we arrive remarked the captain for we shall touch peck slip wharf in half an hour my grandfather entered the cabin and in ten minutes he appeared on deck razor in hand he was smoothly shaved now said the clergyman it's my turn certainly said my grandfather you are next but wait a moment let me draw the razor across the strop 
once or twice putting his foot upon the side rail of the deck and placing one end of the strop upon his leg he drew the razor several times across it then as if by mistake the razor flew from his hand and dropped into the water my grandfather with well-feigned surprise exclaimed in a voice of terror good heavens the razor has fallen overboard such a picture of consternation as covered one half of all the passengers faces was never before witnessed at first they were perfectly silent as if petrified with astonishment but in a few minutes murmurs began to be heard and soon swelled in exclamations an infernal hog said one the meanest thing i ever knew remarked another he ought to be thrown overboard himself cried several others but all remembered that every man who got angry was to pay a fine of twenty dollars and they did not repeat their remarks presently all eyes were turned upon the clergyman he was the most forlorn picture of despair that could be imagined oh this is dreadful he drawled in a tone which seemed as if every word broke a heart-string this was too much and the whole crowd broke into another roar tranquillity was restored the joke though a hard one was swallowed the sloop soon touched the dock the half-shaved passengers now agreed that my grandfather who was the only person on board who appeared like a civilized being should take the lead for the walton house in franklin square and all the rest should follow in indian file he reminded them that they would excite much attention in the streets and enjoined them not to smile they agreed and away they started they attracted a crowd of persons before they reached the corner of pearl street and peck slip but they all marched with as much solemnity as if they were going to the grave the door of the walton house was open old bacchus the landlord was quietly enjoying his cigar while a dozen or two persons were engaged in reading the papers etc in marched the file of nondescripts with the rabble at their heels mr bacchus and his customers started to their feet in astonishment my grandfather marched solemnly up to the bar the passengers followed and formed double rows behind him santa cruz rum for nineteen exclaimed my grandfather to the barkeeper the astonished liquor seller produced bottles and tumblers in double quick time and when bacchus discovered that the nondescripts were old friends and customers he was excited to uncontrollable merriment what in the name of decency has happened he exclaimed that you should all appear here half shaved nothing at all mr bacchus said my grandfather with apparent seriousness these gentlemen chose to wear their beards according to the prevailing fashion in the place they came from and i think it is very hard that they should be stared at and insulted by you yorkers because your fashion happens to differ a trifle from theirs bacchus half believed my grandfather in earnest and the bystanders were quite convinced such was the fact for not a smile appeared upon one of the half-shaved countenances. After sitting a few minutes, the passengers were shown to their rooms, and at tea-time every man appeared at the table, precisely as he came from the sloop. The ladies looked astonished, the waiters winked and laughed, but the subjects of this merriment were as grave as judges in the evening they maintained the same gravity in the bar-room and at ten o'clock they retired to bed with all due solemnity in the morning however bright and early they were in the barber's shop 
undergoing an operation that soon placed them upon a footing with the rest of mankind it is hardly necessary to explain that the clergyman did not appear in that singular procession of sunday afternoon he tied a handkerchief over his face and taking his valets in his hand started for market street where it is presumed he found a good brother and a good razor in season to fill his appointment end of chapter forty five part one recording by lindenbury nielsen vancouver b c chapter forty five part two of struggles and triumphs or forty years recollections of p t barnum written by himself this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda ray nielsen vancouver b c struggles and triumphs of p t barnum chapter forty five a story chapter part two let me give you an illustration of a practical joke which is quite professional as well as practical with the operator and in nine cases out of ten no doubt profitable with all when i was in paris in eighteen forty five there came one day to my room in the hotel bedford where i was staying a smart little frenchman with a case of instruments under his arm he announced himself as a chiropodist he announced himself as a chiropodist who could instantly remove the worst corns not only without pain but he promised by means of a mysterious liniment in his possession to immediately heal the spot from which he removed the corn now i had not a corn on my feet but willing to test his wonderful powers i told him to examine my left foot and to remove a troublesome corn on the little toe surely enough he did remove and exhibit such a corn as i am sure would have prevented my walking had i known that i was so grievously affected he then poured some of his red oil on the toe and triumphantly showed me that the place had already entirely healed pretending to be delighted with his skill i held out another toe for operation and watching him carefully i saw him slip a manufactured corn into his oil bottle which after fumbling a while and pretending to pare the unoffending toe he extracted more delighted than ever i rang the bell and told the servant to send up the landlord as i wished him to witness the extraordinary skill of the corn doctor the landlord arrived and after a few words of eulogy upon the chiropodist i submitted another healthy toe and forth came another monstrous corn for the same process of extraction with the same results could have been performed on the foot of a marble statue it was now my turn to operate so i rose and bolted the door and took off my coat telling the doctor that i greatly admired his gold-mounted instruments and the brazen impudence with which he swindled the public but that this time he had caught a tartar and that he could not leave the room till he had been searched the quack bustled up in grand style at what he termed my ungentlemanly behavior and threatened if i touched him to bring me before the tribunal i remarked that i rather thought the tribunal was the last place on earth at which he desired to appear and then assuring the landlord that the fellow was an errant impostor and that if he would assist me in searching him i would prove it and warrant that no harm should come to the searchers he consented and collared the chiropodist 
the fellow seeing that we were resolved quietly submitted we first searched his pockets and found nothing but on examining his morocco instrument case we discovered a drawer in which were eighty ready-made corns and a small piece of horn which furnished the raw material for the manufacture fortunately my right foot was not bare and i forthwith gave the chiropodist a lesson in the shape of a warm visitation of shoe leather which sent him flying downstairs where the dose was doubled by an attentive servant till the chiropodist reached the street he did not call at the hotel bedford again during my stay i was a good deal amused when i was in brighton england during the same year to see how some people managed to reconcile cash and conscience every one knows that brighton is a fashionable watering place frequented by all sorts of people but the actual residents many of whom are very wealthy are supposed to be quite removed from the fashionable and other follies of the visitors from abroad during the season the millionaires of brighton when i was there were great church goers and at the same time were extensive owners in the stock of their railway which brought so many visitors to the place it was therefore for their interest that trains should run on sundays as well as on other days but as such a course would clash with the religious professions it was necessary that some plan should be devised by which a compromise could be effected between profits and profession cash and conscience for the idea of ever sacrificing interest to principle never enters the minds of those whose religion may be in their heads while it never reaches their hearts the compromise between the duty and the dividends of the brighton railway shareholders was effected as follows after a great deal of talk pro and con on the subject the trains on sunday were permitted to arrive and depart on the following conditions but little noise and confusion was manifest and there were fewer porters employed about the station than on weekdays obliging the arriving and departing passengers not only to look after but to lift their baggage and as bell ringing that is locomotive bell ringing would disturb the sanctity of the sabbath a bugle gave notice of the incoming and outgoing of the trains but even this was not enough it was expressly stipulated that the bugle player should play nothing but sacred music thus trains came in to old hundred or similar psalm tune and went out to the air of dismission common to the hymn commencing lord dismiss us with thy blessing i do not know that this custom is still kept up in brighton but it certainly was so when i was there in eighteen forty five and it was gravely recommended to others who favoured a very strict observance of sunday and yet liked their dividends or were eager for sunday mails in common phrase it was whipping the evil one round the stump in a curious way it reminded me of the good old deacon in connecticut who was in the habit of selling milk to his neighbors all days in the week one sunday however his parson came home with him to tea and while they were at the table a little girl came in for a quart of milk the deacon was afraid of being scandalized in the presence of the parson and so he told the girl he did not sell milk on sunday the girl who had been accustomed to buy on that day as an, on other days was much surprised and turned to go away when the sixpence in her hand was too much of a temptation for the deacon who called out here little girl you can leave the money now 
and call and get the milk to-morrow during my journeyings abroad i was not wholly free from the usual infirmity of travellers viz a desire to look at the old castles of feudal times whether in preservation or in ruins but there was one of our party mr h g sherman who had a peculiar and irresistible taste for the antique he gathered trunks full of stone and timber mementos from every place of note which we visited and if there was anything which he admired more than all else it was an old castle he spent many hours in clambering the broken walls of kenilworth in viewing the towers and dungeons of warwick and climbing the precipices of dumbarton when travelling by coach sherman always secured an outside seat and if possible next to the coachman so as to be able to make inquiries regarding everything which he might happen to see on our journey from belfast to drogheda sherman occupied his usual seat beside the driver and asked him a thousand questions the coachman was a regular wag with general irish wit and he determined to have a little bit of fun at the expense of the inquisitive yankee as we came within eight miles of drogheda the watchful eye of sherman caught the glimpse of a large stone pile appearing like a castle looming up among some trees in a field half a mile from the roadside oh look here what do you call that exclaimed sherman giving the coachman an elbowing in the ribs which was anything but pleasant faith replied the coachman you may well ask what we call that for divil a call do we know what to call it that is a castle sir beyond all question the oldest in ireland indeed none of the old books nor journals contain any account of it it is known however that brian borhomi inhabited it some time though it is supposed to have been built centuries before his day i'll give you half a crown to stop the coach long enough for me to run and bring a scrap of it away said sherman sure and isn't this the royal mail coach and i would not dare detain it for half the bank of ireland replied the honest coachman how far is it to drogheda inquired sherman about eight miles more or less answered the coachman stop your coach and let me down then replied sherman i'll walk to drogheda and would sooner walk three times the distance than not to have a nearer view and carry off a portion of the oldest castle in ireland with that sherman dismounted and raising his umbrella to protect him from the cold rain which was falling in torrents he marched off in the mud calling out to me that i might expect him in dublin by the next train to that which would take us from drogheda the railroad being then completed only to that point from dublin we arrived in dublin about five o'clock cold and uncomfortable but warm apartments and good fires were in waiting for us and in a few hours we had partaken of an excellent supper and were as happy as lords about nine o'clock in the evening the door of our parlor was opened and who should come in but poor sherman drenched to the skin with cold rain the legs of his boots pulled over the bottoms of his pantaloons and covered with thick mud to the very tops and himself looking like a half famished weary and frozen traveller for heaven's sake let me get to the fire exclaimed sherman and we were too much struck with his suffering appearance not to heed it well sherman i remarked that must have been a tedious walk for you 
eight long Irish miles through the rain and mud. I guess you would have thought so if you had walked it yourself, replied Sherman doggedly. I hope you have brought a waste trophies enough from the castle to pay you for all this trouble, I continued. Oh, curse the castle, exclaimed Sherman. What do you mean by that? I asked in astonishment. Oh, you need not look surprised, replied Sherman, for I have no doubt that you and that bog-trotting Irish coachman have had fun enough at my expense before this time. I assured him that I positively had not heard the coachman speak on the subject, and begged him to tell me what had occurred to vex him in this manner. Why, if you don't already know, replied Sherman, I would not have you know for twenty pounds, for you would be sure to publish it. However, now your curiosity is excited, you would be certain to find it all out, if you had to hire a post-chaise and ride there on purpose, so I might as well tell you. Do tell me, I replied, for I confess my curiosity is excited, and I am unable to guess why you are so angry, for I know you love to see castles, and that pleasure you surely have enjoyed, for I caught a glimpse of one myself. No, you have not seen a castle today, nor I either, exclaimed Sherman. What on earth was it then? I asked. A thundering old lime kiln, exclaimed Sherman, and I only wish I could pitch that infernal Irish coachman into it while it was under full blast. It was many a long day before Sherman heard the last of the lime kiln. In fact, this trick of the Irish coachman rendered him cautious in making inquiries of strangers. One day we rode to Donnybrook, the place so much celebrated for its fairs and its black eyes, for it would be quite out of character for Pat to attend a fair without having a flourish of the shalea and a scrimmage which would result in a few broken heads and bloody noses. Near Donnybrook we saw something on the summit of a hill which appeared like a round stone tower. It was probably sixty feet in circumference and twenty-five feet high. I would like to know what that is, said Sherman. I advised him to inquire of the first coachman that came along, but with a forced smile he declined my advice. It can't be a lime kiln at any rate continued sherman it must be a castle of some description the more we looked at it the more mysterious did it appear to us and sherman's castle hunting propensities momentarily increased at last he exclaimed a man who travels with a tongue in his head is a fool if he doesn't use it and I'm not going within a hundred rods of what may be the greatest curiosity in Ireland without knowing it. With that he turned our horse's head towards a fine-looking mansion on our right, where we halted. Sherman jumped from the carriage, opened the small gate, proceeded up the alley of the lawn fronting the house, and rang the bell. A servant appeared at the door. But Sherman, knowing the stupidity of Irish servants, was determined to apply at headquarters for the information he so much desired. Is your master in? asked Sherman. I will see. What name, if you please? A stranger from the United States of America, replied Sherman. The servant departed and in a minute returned and invited Sherman to enter the parlor. He found the gentleman of the mansion sitting by a pleasant fire, near which were also his lady and several visitors and members of the family. Sherman was not troubled with diffidence, 
being seated he hoped he would be excused for having called without an invitation but the fact was he was an american traveller desirous of picking up all important information that might fall his way the gentleman politely replied that no apology was necessary that he was most happy to see him and that any information which he could impart regarding that or any other portion of the country should be given with pleasure thank you replied sherman i will not trouble you except on a single point i have seen all that is important in dublin and its vicinity and in and about donnybrook there is but one thing respecting which i want information and that is the stone tower or castle which we see standing on the hill about a quarter of a mile south of your house if you could give me the name and history of that pile i shall feel extremely obliged oh nothing is easier replied the gentleman with a smile that pile as you call it was built some forty years ago by my father and it was a lucky pile for him for it was the only windmill in these parts and always had plenty to do but a few years ago a hurricane carried off the wings of the mill and ever since that it has stood as it now does a memorial of its former usefulness is there any other important information that i can give you asked the gentleman with the smile not any replied sherman rising to depart but perhaps i can give you some and that is that ireland is beyond all dispute the meanest country i have ever travelled in the only two objects worthy of note that i have seen in all ireland are a lime kiln and the foundation for a windmill upon resuming his seat in the carriage sherman laughed immoderately although he evidently felt somewhat chagrined by this second mistake in searching for ancient castles end of chapter forty five part two recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter forty five part three of struggles and triumphs or forty years recollections of p t barnum written by himself this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c struggles and triumphs of p t barnum chapter forty five a story chapter part three calling one day in one of the principal hotels in dublin i noticed among the rules framed and hung in the coffee room for the warning instruction or entertainment of the guests of the house the following no gambling or politics will be allowed to take place in this house by any parties whatsoever how politics could take place in an irish hotel or elsewhere would have been a mystery to me if i did not remember that the scrimmages and rows which often follow the mere discussion of politics seem to warrant the landlord in classing politics with gambling or any other dangerous amusement which might take place in the coffee-room of an irish inn speaking of irishmen i am reminded of an illustration of ready irish wit which is located on the line of the boston and finchburg railroad some years ago the rev thomas whitmore a wealthy universalist minister who was a large stakeholder in the road was appointed president of the company and as he was exceedingly conscientious in the discharge of his duty he once took upon himself to walk over every foot of the route 
to see if every part of the road was in complete order walking along in this way and alone he came to a place where a loose rail lay alongside of the track and seeing an irishman near by who was apparently employed on the road mr whitmore called out to him here pat pick up this rail and lay it alongside of the fence out of the way till it is wanted it never occurred to mr whitmore that every man whom he met did not know him and his official position but pat not dreaming that his virtual employer the president of the railroad company was giving him an order sharply answered just go to the devil will ye my dear friend said the smiling whitmore who instantly comprehended the situation that is that pat did not know him and no particular wonder either go to the devil why that is the last place i should desire to go and faith and i think it's the last place you will be going to responded pat of railroads and railroad travel and employees i have heard and told no end of stories but one of the latest and best i think is told of a man in a town down east who had some difficulty with a conductor and vowed that not an other cent of his money should ever go into the treasury of that company but said the conductor of the road you own property in one place on the line and do business in another place and are obliged to go back and forth almost every day how are you going to help paying something to the company oh hereafter i shall pay my fare to you in the cars was the reply it might be a joke but conductors themselves that is some of them are more or less fictitious on the subject of what in the vernacular is known as knocking down soon after the conductors on the new york and new haven railroad were put in costume while on duty and were obliged to wear a badge bearing the initials of the company my friend reverend dr chapin was accompanying me over the road to my bridgeport home when along came a conductor whom we both knew well to collect our fares ah i see said dr chapin pointing to the letters on the new badge n h n y neither here nor yonder no whispered the conductor confidentially to the doctor's ear it means new house next year it is scarcely necessary to tell the thousands who knew dr chapin that he is a man of most ready wit and an inveterate punster one day when we were th dining together i was carving a chicken which the doctor pronounced a heinous offence when after having some difficulty with a tough wing i exclaimed how shall i get the thing off anyhow pull it gravely answered the doctor exactly said i then began what the doctor called a battle of the spurs i trying to crow over the doctor and he endeavoring to upset my calculations urging me meanwhile to scratch away till at last i told him if he made another pun on that lay he would knock me off the roost oh then said the doctor finally feathering his nest shan't i clear an equally foul pun of the doctor's was perpetrated in cold blood or rather in very cold water down at rockport massachusetts thither every summer season were wont to congregate for their vacation and celebrated clergymen as star king dr chapin and others mainly for the fine sea bathing there one season dr chapin arrived at least a fortnight behind the rest 
and when they went down bathing together the acclaimed visitors pronounced the water to be delightful just right and so on but isn't it cold asked dr chapin oh no replied star king you have only to go down and up twice and you are warm enough ah i see how it is said dr chapin who tried the experiment and came up half frozen you are warm after down and up twice why is that a pair o ducks fowls naturally suggest the market and this brings to mind a neighbor of mine in new york who keeps two things a boarding house and bad hours his wife justly suspected him of gambling but he generally managed to get in before midnight and always had money enough in his pocket to go to market within the morning on one occasion however after gambling all night he did not come home till six o'clock in the morning when after a sound scolding from his wife for staying out all night and gambling as she insisted he was sent to the market to get something for breakfast returning he was again berated by his wife for gambling protesting all the while that he had been spending the night with a sick friend his wife might have believed him if he had not sat down at the head of the table half asleep and solemnly passed the bread to the nearest boarder with the exclamation cut that's your sick friend exclaimed the wife while a general roar around the table woke the host to the fact that he was passing bread and not a pack of cards this story-telling carries me back to my boyhood days at bethel and brings to mind an old clerical acquaintance whom i knew long before i met dr chapin the rev richard verrett day who resided at greenfield connecticut was in the habit of coming to bethel to preach on sabbath evenings he was a very eloquent preacher and an eccentric man he possessed fine talents his sermons were rich in pathos and wit and he was exceedingly popular with the world's people the more straight-laced however were afraid of him his remarks both in and out of the pulpit would frequently rub hard against some popular dogma or knock in the head some favorite religious tenant mr day was therefore frequently in hot water with the church and was either suspended or about to be brought to trial for some alleged breach of ministerial duty or some suspected hearsay while thus debarred from preaching he felt that he must do something to support his family with this view he visited bethel danbury and other towns and delivered lectures at the termination of which contributions for his benefit were taken up i remember his lecturing in bethel on charity this discourse overflowed with eloquence and pathos and terminated in a contribution of more than fifty dollars it was said that on one occasion mr day was about to be tried before an ecclesiastical body at milton there being no railroads in those days many persons travelled on horseback two days before the trial was to take place mr day started for middletown alone and on horseback his valet was fastened behind the saddle and putting on his large greatcoat surmounted with a half a dozen broad capes as was the fashion of that period and donning a broad-brimmed hat he mounted his horse and started for the scene of trial on the second day of his journey and some ten miles before reaching middleton he overtook a brother clergyman also on horseback who was wending his way to the consocation 
he was a man perhaps sixty years of age and his silvered look stood out like porcupine quills his iron visage would seem never to have worn a smile his sinister expression small keen selfish-looking eyes and compressed lips convinced mr day that he had no hope of mercy from that man as one of his judges the reverend gentleman soon fell into conversation the sanctimonious clergyman gave his name and residence and inquired those of mr day my friend is mr richard replied reverend richard v day and my residence is fairfield grinfield is a parish in the town of fairfield ah exclaimed the other clergyman then you live near mr day do you know him perfectly well responded the eccentric richard well what do you think of him inquired the anxious brother he is a wide awake cunning fellow one whom i should be sorry to offend for i would not like to fall into his clutches but if compelled to do so i could divulge some things which would astonish our consolation is it possible well of course your duty to the church and the redeemer's cause will prompt you to make a clean breast of it and divulge everything you know against the accused responded the excited clergyman it is hard to destroy a brother's reputation and break up the peace of his family answered the meek mr richard it is the duty of the elect to expose and punish the reprobates replied the sturdy puritan but i had not better first tell our brother his fault and give him an opportunity to confess and be forgiven our brother as you call him is undoubtedly a heretic and the true faith is wounded by his presence among us the church may be purged from unbelief we must beware of those who would introduce damnable hearsays are you sure that mr day is an unbeliever inquired the modest mr richard i have heard that he throws doubt upon the trinity shrugs his shoulders at some portions of the saybrook platform and has said that even reprobates may sincerely repent pray for forgiveness and be saved a that he even doubts the damnation of unregenerate infants horrible ejaculated mr richard yes horrible indeed but i trust that our consolation will excommunicate him at once and forever but what do you know concerning his belief i know nothing specially against his belief responded mr richard but i have witnessed some of his acts which i should be almost sorry to expose a mistaken charity it is your duty to tell the consecration all you know regarding the culprit and i shall insist upon you doing so i certainly desire to do that which is right and just and as i am but young in the ministry i shall defer to your judgment founded on age and experience but i would prefer at first to state to you what i know and then will be guided by your advice in regard to giving any testimony before the consecration a very proper course you can state the facts to me and i will give you my counsel now what do you know i know that on more than one occasion i have caught him in the act of kissing my wife replied the injured mr richard i am not at all astonished responded the clergyman such conduct coincides exactly with the opinion i had formed of the man i commiserate you sir but i honor your sense of duty in divulging such important facts even at the expense of exposing serious troubles in your domestic relations but sir 
justice must have its course these facts must be testified to before the consecration do you know anything else against the delinquent i know something more but it is of a nature so delicate and concerns me personally so seriously that i must decline divulging it sir you cannot do that i will not permit it but you will insist on your telling the whole truth before our consecration though your heart-strings were to break in consequence i repeat sir that i sympathize with you personally but personal feelings must be swallowed up in the promotion of public good no sympathy for an individual can be permitted to clash with the interests of the true church you had better tell me sir all you know since you say that duty requires it i will do so i have caught him under very suspicious circumstances in my wife's bedroom said the unfortunate mr richard was your wife in bed inquired the man with the iron face she was faintly lisped the almost swooning mr richard enough enough was the response our consecration will soon dispose of the rev richard v day the two clergymen had now arrived at middleton the rev mr vinegar face rode to the parsonage while mr day alias mr richard went to a small and obscure inn the consecration commenced the next day the ecclesiastical body was soon organized and after disposing of several minor questions it was proposed to take up the charges of hearsay against the rev mr day the accused with a most demure countenance was conversing with his quondam travelling companion of the day previous who upon hearing this proposition instantly sprang to his feet and informed the rev chairman that providentially he had been put in possession of facts which must necessarily result in the immediate expulsion of the culprit from the church and save the necessity of examining testimony on the question of hearsay in fact continued he i am prepared to prove that rev richard v day has frequently kissed the wife of one of our brethren and has also been caught in a situation which affords strong evidence of his being guilty of the crime of adultery a thrill of horror and surprise ran through the assembly every eye was turned to mr day who was seated so closely to the last speaker that he touched him as he resumed his seat mr day's countenance was as placid as a may morning and it required keen vision to detect the lurking smile of satisfaction that peeped from a corner of his eye a few minutes of dead silence elapsed produce your witnesses finally said the chairman in an almost sceptral voice i call on the rev mr richard of fairfield to collaborate under oath the charges which i have made responded the hard-visaged puritan not a person moved mr day looked as unconcerned as if he was an utter stranger to all present and understood not the language which they were speaking where is the rev mr richard inquired the venerable chairman here he is responded the accuser familiarly tapping mr day on the shoulder the whole audience burst into such a roar of laughter as probably never was heard in a like consultation before the accuser was almost petrified with astonishment at such inconceivable conduct on the part of that sedate religious assembly mr day alone maintained the utmost gravity that sir is the rev richard v day 
replied the chairman when order was restored the look of utter dismay which instantly marked the countenance of the accuser threw the assembly into another convulsion of laughter during which mr day's victim withdrew and was not seen again in middleton the charges of hearsay were then brought forward after a brief investigation they were dismissed for want of proof and mr day returned to greenfield triumphant end of chapter forty five part three recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter forty five part four of struggles and triumphs or forty years recollections of p t barnum written by himself this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c struggles and triumphs of p t barnum chapter forty five my story chapter part four i have often heard mr day relate the following anecdote a young couple called on him one day at his house in greenfield they informed him that they were from the southern portion of the state and desired to be married they were well dressed made considerable display of jewelry and altogether wore an air of respectability mr day felt confident that all was right and calling in several witnesses he proceeded to unite them in the holy bonds of wedlock after the ceremonies were concluded mr day invited the happy pair as was usual in those days to partake of some cake and wine they thus spent a social half-hour together and on rising to depart the bridegroom handed mr day a twenty-dollar bank note remarking that this was the smallest bill he had but if he would be so good as to pay their hotel bill they had merely dined and fed their horse at the hotel he could retain the balance of the money for his services mr day thanked him for his liberality and went at once to the hotel with the lady and gentlemen and informed the landlord that he would settle their bill they proceeded on their journey and the next day it was discovered that the bank note was a counterfeit and that mr day had to pay nearly three dollars for the privilege of marrying this lovely couple the newspapers in various parts of the state subsequently published facts which showed that the affectionate pair got married in every town they passed through thus paying their expenses and fleecing the clergyman by means of counterfeits one of the deacons of mr day's church asked him if he usually kissed the bride at weddings always was the reply how do you manage when the happy pair are negroes was the deacon's next question in all such cases replied mr day the duty of kissing is appointed to the deacons my grandfather was a universalist and for various reasons fancied or real he was bitterly opposed to the presbyterians in doctrinal views though personally some of them were his warmest and most intimate friends being much attached to mr day he induced that gentleman to deliver a series of sunday evening sermons in bethel and my grandfather was not only on all these occasions one of the most prominent and attentive hearers but mr day was always his guest he would generally stop over monday and tuesday with my grandfather and as several of the most social neighbors were called in they usually had a jolly time of it occasionally mine host would attack mr day good-naturedly on theological points 
and would generally come off second best but he delighted although vanquished to repeat the sharp answers with which mr day met his objections to the confession of faith one day when a dozen or more of the neighbors were present and enjoying themselves in passing around the bottle relating anecdotes and cracking jokes my grandfather called out in a loud tone of voice which at once arrested the attention of all present friend day i believe you pretend to believe in foreordination to be sure i do replied mr day well now suppose i should spit in your face what would you do inquired my grandfather i hope that it is not a supposable case responded mr day for i should probably knock you down that would be very inconsistent replied my grandfather exultingly for if i spat in your face it would be because it was foreordained i should do so why then would you be so unreasonable as to knock me down because it would be foreordained that i should knock you down replied mr day with a smile the company burst into laugh in which my grandfather heartily joined my father as well as my grandfather was very fond of a practical joke and he lost no occasion which offered for playing off one upon his friends and neighbors in addition to his store tavern and freight wagon business to norwalk he kept a small livery stable and on one occasion a young man named nelson beers applied to him for the use of a horse to ride to danbury a distance of three miles nelson was an apprentice to the shoemaking business nearly out of his time was not overstocked with brains and lived a mile and a half east of our village my father thought it would be better for nelson to make his short journey on foot than to be at the expense of hiring a horse but he did not tell him so we had an old horse named bob having reached an age beyond his teens he was turned out in a bog lot near our house to die he was literally a living skeleton much in the same condition of the yankee's nag which was so weak his owner had to hire his neighbor's horse to help him draw his last breath my father in reply to nelson's application told him that the livery horses were all out and he had none at home except a famous racehorse which he was keeping in low flesh in order to have him proper trim to win a great race soon to come off oh do let me have him uncle phil my father's name was philo but as it was the custom in the region to call everybody's uncle or aunt or squire or deacon or colonel or captain my father's general title among his acquaintances was uncle phil i will ride him very carefully and not injure him in the least besides i will have him rubbed down and fed in danbury said nelson beers he is too valuable an animal to risk in the hands of a young man like you responded my father nelson continued to importune and my father to play off until it was finally agreed that the horse could be had on the condition that he should in no case be ridden faster than a walk or slow trot and that he should be fed four quarts of oats at danbury nelson started on his rosinate looking for all the world as if he was on a mission to the carrion crows but he felt every inch a man for he fancied himself astride of the greatest racehorse in the country and realized that a heavy responsibility 
was resting on his shoulders for the last words of my father to him were now nelson if any accident should happen to this animal while under your charge you could not pay for the damage in a lifetime of labor old bob was duly oated and watered at danbury and at the end of several hours mr beers mounted him and started for bethel he concluded to take the great pasture road home that being the name of a new road cut through swamps and meadows as a shorter route to our village nelson for the nonce forgetting his responsibility probably tried the speed of his racehorse and soon broke him down at all events something occurred to weaken old bob's nerves for he came to a standstill and nelson was forced to dismount the horse trembled with weakness and nelson beers trembled with fright a small brook was running through the bog at the roadside and beers thinking that perhaps his racehorse needed a drink led him into the stream poor old bob struck fast in the mud and not having strength to withdraw his feet quietly closed his eyes and like a patriarch as he was dropped into the soft bed that was awaiting him and died without a single kick no language can describe the consternation of poor beers he could not believe his eyes and vainly tried to open those of his horse he placed his ear at the mouth of poor old bob but took it away again in utter dismay the breath had ceased at last nelson groaning as he thought of meeting my father and wondering whether eternity added to time would be long enough for him to earn the value of the horse took the bridle from the dead head and unbuckling the girth drew off the saddle placed it on his own back and trudged gloomily towards our village it was about sundown when my father espied his victim coming up the street with a saddle and bridle thrown across his shoulders his face wearing a look of the most complete despair my father was certain that old bob had departed this life and he chuckled inwardly and quietly but instantly assumed a more serious countenance poor beers approaching more slowly and mournfully than if he was following a dear friend to the grave when he came within hailing distance my father called out why beers is it possible you have been so careless as to let that racehorse run away from you oh worse than that worse than that uncle phil groaned nelson worse than that then he has been stolen by some judge of valuable horses oh what a fool i was to entrust him to anybody exclaimed my father with well feigned sorrow no he ain't stolen uncle phil said nelson not stolen well i am glad of that for i shall recover him again but where is he i'm afraid you haven't lamed him worse than that drawled the unfortunate nelson well what is the matter where is he what ails him asked my father oh i can't tell you i can't tell you said beers with a groan but you must tell me returned my father it will break your heart groaned beers to be sure it will if he is seriously injured replied my father but where is he he's dead said beers as he nerved himself up for the announcement and then closing his eyes sat in a chair completely overcome with fright my father groaned in a way that startled nelson to his feet again all the sensations of horror intense agony and despair were depicted to the life on my father's countenance oh uncle phil uncle phil 
don't be too hard with me i wouldn't have had it happen for all the world said beers you can never recompense me for that horse replied my father i know it i know it uncle phil i can only work for you as long as i live but you shall have my services till you are satisfied after my apprenticeship is finished returned beers after a short time my father became more calm and although apparently not reconciled to his loss he asked nelson how much he supposed he ought to owe him oh i don't know i am no judge of the value of blood horses but i have been told they are worth fortunes sometimes replied beers and mine was one of the best in the world said my father and in such perfect condition for running all bone and muscle oh yes i saw that said beers despondently but with a frankness that showed he did not wish to deny the great claims of the horse and his owner well said my father with a sigh as i have no desire to go to law on the subject we had better try to agree upon the value of the horse you may mark on a slip of paper what sum you think you ought to owe me for him and i will do the same we can then compare notes and see how far we differ i will mark said beers but uncle phil don't be too hard with me i will be easy as i can and endeavor to make some allowance for your situation said my father but nelson when i think how valuable that horse was of course i must mark something in the neighborhood of the amount of cash i would have received for him i believe however nelson that you are an honest young man and are willing to do what you think is about right i therefore wish to caution you not to mark down one cent more than you really think under the circumstances you ought to pay me when you are able and for which you are now willing to give me your note of hand you will recollect that i told you when you applied for the horse that i did not wish to let him go nelson gave my father a grateful look and assented to all he said at least a dozen of our joke-loving neighbors were witnessing the scene with great apparent solemnity two slips of paper were prepared my father marked on one and after much hesitation beers wrote on the other well let us see what you have marked said my father i suppose you will think it is too low replied beers handing my father the slip of paper only three hundred and seventy five dollars exclaimed my father reading the paper well that is a pretty specimen of gratitude for you nelson was humbled and could not muster sufficient courage to ask my father what he had marked finally one of our neighbors asked my father to show his paper he did so he had marked six and a quarter cents our neighbor read it aloud and a shock of mirth ensued which fairly lifted beers to his feet it was some time before he could comprehend the joke and when he became fully aware that no harm was done he was the happiest fellow i had ever seen i might fill a volume with these reminiscences of my younger days but turning once more to my foreign notebooks i find material there which seems to claim a place in this story chapter i am never tired of telling and laughing at some of my mishaps and adventures in trying to use the french language when i first went abroad it was no unusual thing to travel half a day in a diligence or in the cars with some englishmen as i would afterwards discover 
both of us doing our best to make ourselves intelligible to each other in french till at last in despair one of the other would utter the conventional conundrum parlez-vous anglais why of course i am an american or an englishman and then a mutual roar would follow american or english or dutch french is generally quite a different thing from french french thus i could always understand the dutchman who spoke to me in french in amsterdam and i may add they could perfectly understand me we spoke the same patois i wrote to my wife i remember from amsterdam that i found they spoke much purer french in that city than in paris once on arriving in paris at the station of the northern railway i with other passengers was in the room devoted to the examination of baggage among the rest was a party consisting of a new york merchant and his wife with their daughter a young lady of eighteen who was at once volatile and voluble undoubtedly she had spoken the best madison avenue school french for five years or more and with this she fairly overwhelmed the official interpreter who was present after hearing her for full five minutes the interpreter gravely asked do you speak english miss certainly was the reply well speak english then if you please for i can understand your english better than i can your french i was one evening at the house of my friend mr john nemo in paris and while waiting for him and his family to return from the theatre was entertained for an hour or more by two very agreeable young ladies to whom i made such reply in french from time to time as i could at last came the inevitable inquiry as to the capacity of the young ladies in the english language why bless us mr barnum was the reply we are scotch governesses who are here in paris simply to learn french the last time i went from france to england arriving late at night i stopped in dover at the hotel nearest the custom house so as to look after my luggage next day ringing my bell early in the morning for shaving water half asleep i called out to the serving maid for la eau chaude please sir was the reply i do not speak french nor i either said i promptly just bring me some hot water if you please but some of the english have a queer way of speaking their own language and the cockney's management of what he would call the haspirate is sufficiently familiar crowding into exeter hall london at an entertainment one evening i heard the usher just before me shouting out seats as he looked at the checks in this fashion letter ha first row letter half sixth row letter he fifth row letter high ninth row and so on seeing that my own check was l i showed it to him and quietly inquired where do i go usher you go to hell was the prompt response which was not intended to be either profane or impolite but i must bring this story-telling chapter an episode in the narrative of graver events in my autobiography to a close and discourse of seaside park and waldemere End of chapter 45, part 4. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 46 of Struggles and Triumphs, or Forty Years' Recollections of P.T. Barnum. 
written by himself. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona. Struggles and Triumphs of P.T. Barnum, Chapter 46, Seaside Park. From the time when I first settled in Bridgeport and turned my attention to opening and beautifying new avenues and doing whatever lay in my power to extend and improve that charming city, I was exceedingly anxious that public parks should be established, especially one where good driveways and an opportunity for the display of the many fine equipages for which Bridgeport is celebrated could be afforded. Mr. Noble and I began the movement by presenting to the city the beautiful ground in East Bridgeport, now known as Washington Park, a most attractive promenade and breathing place, and a continual resort for citizens on both sides of the river, particularly in the summer evenings, when one of the city bands is an additional attraction to the pleasant spot. Thus our new city was far in advance of Bridgeport proper in providing a prime necessity for the health and amusement of the people. Our park projects in the city date as far back as the year 1850. At that time, by an arrangement with Deacon David Sherwood, who lived in Fairfield, a few rods west of the Bridgeport line, and who owned land adjoining mine, we agreed to throw open a large plot of ground free to the public provided State Street in Bridgeport was continued west so as to pass through this land but a few old fogies through whose land the street would pass, thereby improving their property thousands of dollars in value, stupidly opposed the project in the Fairfield town meeting, and the measure was defeated. Seventeen years afterward, in 1867, after a long sleep, these same old fogies managed to awake, as did the citizens of Fairfield generally, and then State Street was extended without opposition. But property to some extent, had changed hands and had largely increased in value, so that the chance of having a free park in that locality was forever lost, and the town was actually obliged to pay Deacon Sherwood for the privilege of continuing the highway through his land. How many similar opportunities for benefiting the public and posterity in all coming time are carelessly thrown away in every town, through the mere stupidity of mole-eyed landowners who stand as stumbling blocks not only in the way of public improvements but directly in opposition to their individual interests and thus for scores of years rob the community of the pleasures to be derived from broad avenues lined with shade trees and from open and free public grounds up to the year 1865, the shore of Bridgeport, west of the public wharves, and washed by the waters of Long Island Sound, was inaccessible to carriages, or even to horsemen, and almost impossible for pedestrianism. The shore edge, in fact, was strewn with rocks and boulders, which made it, like Jordan in the song, an exceedingly hard road to travel. A narrow lane reaching down to the shore enabled parties to drive near to the water for the purpose of clamming and occasionally bathing, but it was all claimed as private property by the land proprietors whose farms extended down to the water's edge. On several occasions at low tide, I endeavored to ride along the shore on horseback for the purpose of examining the lay of the land in the hope of finding it feasible to get a public drive along the water's edge. On one occasion, in 1863, I succeeded in getting my horse around from the foot of Broad Street in Bridgeport to a lane over the Fairfield Line, a few rods west of Iranistan Avenue, a grand street which I have since opened at my own expense and through my own land. From the observations I made that day, I was satisfied that a most lovely park and public drive might be and ought to be opened along the whole waterfront as far as the western boundary line of bridgeport and even extending over the fairfield line foreseeing that in a few years such an improvement would be too late and having in mind the failure of the attempt in eighteen fifty to provide a park for the people of bridgeport i immediately began to agitate the subject in the bridgeport papers 
and also in daily conversations with such of my fellow citizens as i thought would take an earnest and immediate interest in the enterprise i urged that such an improvement would increase the taxable value of property in that vicinity many thousands of dollars and thus enrich the city treasury that it would improve the value of real estate generally in the city that it would be an additional attraction to strangers who came to spend the summer with us and to those who might be induced from other considerations to make the city their permanent residence that the improvement would throw into market some of the most beautiful building sites that could be found anywhere in connecticut and i dwelt upon the absurdity almost criminality that a beautiful city like bridgeport lying on the shore of a broad expanse of salt water should so cage itself in that not an inhabitant could approach the beach with these and like arguments and entreaties i plied the people day in and day out till some of them began to be familiarized with the idea that a public park close upon the shore of the sound was at least a possible if not probable thing but certain conservatives as they are called said barnum is a harebrained fellow who thinks he can open and people a new york broadway through a connecticut wilderness and the old fogies added yes he is trying to start another chestnut wood fire for the city to blow forever but the city or town of bridgeport will not pay out money to lay out or to purchase public parks if people want to see green grass and trees they have only to walk or drive half a mile either way from the city limits and they will come to farms where they can see either or both for nothing and if they are anxious to see salt water and to get a breath of the sound breeze they can take boats at the wharves or sail a row till they are entirely satisfied thus talk the conservatives and the old fogies who unhappily even if they are in a minority are always a force in all communities i soon saw that it was of no use to expect to get the city to pay for a park the next thing was to see if the land could not be procured free of charge or at a nominal cost provided the city would improve and maintain it as a public park i approached the farmers who owned the land lying immediately upon the shore and tried to convince them that if they would give the city free a deep slip next to the water to be used as a public park it would increase in value the rest of their land so much as to make it a profitable operation for them but it was like beating against the wind they were not so stupid as to think that they could become gainers by giving away their property such trials of patience as i underwent in a twelvemonth in the endeavor to carry this point few persons who have not undertaken like almost hopeless labor can comprehend at last i enlisted the attention of messrs nathaniel wheeler james loomis francis ives frederick wood and a few more gentlemen and persuaded them to walk with me over the ground which to me seemed in every way practicable for a park these gentlemen who were men of taste as well as of enterprise and public spirit very soon coincided in my ideas as to the feasibility of the plan and the advantages of the site and some of them went with me to talk with the landowners adding their own pleas to the arguments i had already advanced at last after much pressing and persuading we got the terms upon which the proprietors would give a portion and sell another portion of their land which fronted on the water provided the land thus disposed of should forever be appropriated to the purposes of a public park but unfortunately a part of the land it was desirable to include was a small mallet farm of some thirty acres then belonging to an unsettled estate and neither the administrator nor the heirs could or would give away a rod of it but the whole farm was for sale and to overcome the difficulty in the way of its transfer for the public benefit i bought it for about twelve thousand dollars and then presented the required front to the park i did not want this land or any portion of it for my own purposes or profit and i offered a thousand dollars to any one who would take my place in the transaction but no one accepted and i was quite willing to contribute so much of the land as was needed for so noble an object indeed besides this i gave fourteen hundred dollars towards purchasing other land and improving the park and after months of persistent and personal effort 
I succeeded in raising, by private subscription, the sum necessary to secure the land needed. This was duly paid for, deeded to, and accepted by the city, and I had the pleasure of naming this new and great public improvement Seaside Park. Public journals are generally exponents of public opinion, and how the people viewed the new purchase, now their own property, may be judged by the following extracts from the leading local newspapers when the land for the new enterprise was finally secured. Our Seaside Park from the Bridgeport Standard, August 21, 1865. Bridgeport has taken another broad stride of which she may well be proud. The Seaside Park is a fixed fact. Yesterday, Messrs. P.T. Barnum, Captain John Brooks, Mr. George Bailey, Captain Burr Knapp, and Henry Wheeler generously donated to this city sufficient land for the park, with the exception of seven or eight acres, which have been purchased by private subscriptions. Last night, the Common Council appointed excellent park commissioners, and work on the seawall and the avenues surrounding the park will be commenced at once. Besides securing the most lovely location for a park to be found between New York and Boston, which for all time will be a source of pride to our city and state, there is no estimating the pecuniary advantage which this great improvement will eventually prove to our citizens. Plans are afoot and enterprises are agitated in regard to a park hotel, seaside cottages, horse railroad branch, and other features which, when consummated, will serve to amaze our citizens to think that such a delightful seaside frontage has been permitted to lie so long unimproved. To Mr. P. T. Barnum, we believe, is awarded the credit of originating this beautiful improvement and certainly to his untiring, constant, and persevering personal efforts are we indebted for its being finally consummated. Honorable James C. Loomis was the first man who heartily joined with Barnum in pressing the plan of a seaside park upon the attention of our citizens, but it is due to our citizens themselves to say that, with an extraordinary unanimity, they have not only voted to appropriate $10,000 from the city treasury to making the avenues around the park, and otherwise improving it, but they have also generously aided by private contributions in purchasing such land as was not freely given for the park. Of course, we shall not only, at an early day, publish the names of such citizens as have subscribed money for this purpose, but they will also be handed down to posterity, as they will richly deserve, in the publications of the park commissioners. From the Bridgeport Standard, August 21, 1865. The names of P.T. Barnum, Captain John Brooks, Mr. George Bailey, Captain Burr Knapp, and Henry Wheeler have gone into history as the generous contributors to the best enterprise ever attempted for the benefit of our city, and the city has accepted the trust with the most commendable promptness and appointed its commissioners who have already entered upon their duties. We shall watch now with eager interest the unfolding and development of such a park as can nowhere be found on either side of the sound, and one which shall be a thing of beauty and a joy forever to our city. It needs but for the hand of a skillful art, assisted by a proper public spirit, to render the seaside park a charm spot of delightful resort for public drives or private walks. The commissioners chosen to superintend the inauguration of the laying out and improvements of the grounds are men of correct taste, of good judgment, and of liberal and comprehensive views as to the wants and demands of a growing city, like Bridgeport. They understand that nature is here to be made so attractive by art, that all classes shall be drawn hither not merely for the pleasure of enjoying a favorite resort, but also for the profit which comes to the nobler impulses of our nature by the contemplation of cunning handicraft upon the landscape as god left it for man to adorn and beautify here will be planted trees of every variety that will endure the temperature of this latitude and flowers of every hue and perfume here will walks serpentine through shady groves and anon lead out to behold the broad expanse of the beautiful sound someone has aptly said 
that one work of art was worth a thousand lectures on art here then let the statues of the artist be placed to educate the masses by their silent teachings and win them to higher ideas and better views of life by their mute eloquence one feature of american parks is especially worthy of mention they are essentially and emphatically democratic they are made for the people and are in turn appreciated by the people they are open alike to the millionaire with his coach and six and the poor pedestrian without a penny the advantages possessed by bridgeport as a manufacturing city are becoming daily more and more appreciated by businessmen from various portions of the country there is no city in the state which can compare with ours in the recent erection of large and permanent manufacturing establishments this fact brings into our midst a large industrial population for which even now the supply of dwellings is inadequate to the demand this population commingling and combining with our own and possessing energy enterprise business tact and intelligence will rapidly develop the resources of our city and its surroundings for mechanical pursuits and the productions of the various manufacturing establishments already erected or in the process of erection to such a class the benefits of a park possessing such facilities for recreation and improvement as the seaside park will present will be incalculable in fostering the health promoting the happiness and elevating the taste of all who can avail themselves of its beneficial influences to the public-spirited gentlemen who have so generously donated to the city the land for the seaside park bridgeport owes a debt of gratitude which she can never repay their names will descend to posterity and be remembered with pride and exultation as among the noblest of public benefactors so long as the flowers bloom and the waves wash the margin of the seaside park no citizen of bridgeport identified with her growth and prosperity and having the future welfare of the city at heart should fail to contribute in such a manner as best he may to such a grand improvement let our citizens take hold of this noble enterprise with that large and liberal spirit in which it has been conceived and thus far consummated and bridgeport will ere long possess an attraction which will draw hither for permanent residence much of the wealth and intelligence refinement and virtue of the great metropolis which now sequesters itself along the banks of the hudson or among the sand knolls of new jersey thus was my long-cherished plan at length fulfilled nor did my efforts end here for i aided and advised in all important matters in the laying out and progress of the new park and in july eighteen sixty nine i gave to the city several acres of land worth at the lowest valuation five thousand dollars which were added to and included in this public pleasure ground and now make the west end of the park at the beginning the park on paper and the park in reality were two quite different things the inaccessibility of the site was remedied by approaches which permitted the hundreds of workmen to begin to grade the grounds and to lay out the walks and drives the rocks and boulders over which i had more than once attempted to make my way on foot and on horseback were devoted to the building of a substantial sea wall under the able superintendence of mr david w sherwood paths were opened shade trees were planted and fortunately there was in a very centre of the ground a beautiful grove of full growth which is one of the most attractive features of this now charming spot and a broad and magnificent drive follows the curves of the shore and encircles the entire park all the work is constantly going on and much remains to be done yet a considerable portion of the park presents a finished appearance a large covered music stand has been built and on a rising piece of the ground a substantial foundation has been built for a soldier's monument the cornerstone of this monument was laid with impressive ceremonies and a military display in the presence of a large concourse of citizens and soldiers among whom were major general alfred h terry u s a 
Major General and Governor Joseph H. Hawley, Adjutant General Charles T. Stanton, Quartermaster General Julius S. Gilman, Surgeon General Philo G. Rockwell, Paymaster General William B. Wooster, Aide de Camp and Colonel John H. Burnham, Alfred P. Rockwell, William H. Mallory, Charles M. Coit, General S. W. Kellogg of the 1st Brigade, Colonel S. E. Merwin, Jr., Colonel Crawford, and other officers of the Governor's staff and of the Connecticut State Militia. The Branch Horse Railroad already reaches one of the main entrances and brings down crowds of people every day and evening, and especially on the evenings in which the band plays. At such times, the avenues are not only thronged with superb equipages and crowds of people, but the whole harbor is alive with rowboats, sailboats, and yachts. The views on all sides are charming. In the rear is the city, with its roofs and spires. Black Rock and Stratford lights are in plain sight. To the eastward and southward stretches Old Long Island sea girt shore, and between lies the broad expanse of the salt water with its ever fresh breezes and the perpetual panorama of sails and steamers. I do not believe that a million dollars today would compensate the city of Bridgeport for the loss of what is confessed to be the most delightful public pleasure ground between New York and Boston. For these magnificent results, accomplished in so short a time, the people of Bridgeport are indebted to the park commissioners, and especially to Mr. Nathaniel Wheeler, whose untiring energy and exquisite taste have been mainly instrumental in bringing this work forward to its present state of completion. There is easy and cheap access to this ground by means of the horse railroad from East Bridgeport and Fairfield, and numerous avenues open directly upon the park from Bridgeport. It is the daily resort of thousands who go to inhale the salt sea air, and the main drive is already, on a lesser scale, to the citizens of Bridgeport, what the Grand Avenue in Central Park is to the people of New York. With this priceless advantage, however, in favor of Seaside Park, of a frontage on the Sound, and a shore on which the waves are ever breaking, and sounding the grand, unending story of the mysteries of the great deep. On the western and northern margins of this public ground, in sight of the Sound, and in full view of every part of the park, will hereafter be built the villas and mansions of the wealthiest citizens, and, when the hand that now pens these lines is stilled forever, and thousands look from these seaside residences across the water to Long Island shore, and over the groves and lawns and walks and drives of the beautiful ground at their feet, it may be a source of gratification and pride to my posterity, to hear the expressions of gratitude that possibly will be expressed to the memory of their ancestor who secured to all future generations the benefits and blessings of seaside park end of chapter forty six recording by nancy cochran gergen gilbert arizona chapter forty seven of struggles and triumphs or forty years recollections of p t barnum written by himself this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nancy cochran gergen gilbert arizona struggles and triumphs of p t barnum chapter forty seven waldemir what i can call without undue display of egotism or vanity my public life may be said to have closed with my formal and final retirement from the managerial profession when my second museum was destroyed by fire march three eighteen sixty eight but he must have been a careless reader of these pages which record the acts and aspirations of a long and industrious career who does not see that what in opposition to my public life may be considered my private life has also been largely devoted to the comfort convenience and permanent prosperity of the community with which so many of my hopes and happiest days are thoroughly identified i speak of these things i trust with becoming modesty 
and yet with less reluctance than i should do if my fellow citizens of bridgeport had not generally and generously awarded me sometimes perhaps more than my need of praise for my unremitting and earnest efforts to promote whatever would conduce to the growth and improvement of our charming city when i first selected bridgeport as a permanent residence for my family its nearness to new york and the facilities for daily transit to and from the metropolis were present and partial consideration only in the general advantages the location seemed to offer nowhere in all my travels in america and abroad had i seen a city whose very position presented so many and varied attractions situated on long island sound with that vast water view in front and on every other side a beautiful and fertile country with every variety of inland scenery and charming drives which led through valleys rich with well-cultivated farms and over hills thick wooded with far-stretching forests of primeval growth all these natural attractions appeared to me only so many aids to the advancement the beautiful and busy city might attain if public spirit enterprise and money grasped and improved the opportunities the locality itself extended i saw that what nature had so freely lavished must be supplemented by yet more liberal art consequently and quite naturally when i projected and established my first residence in bridgeport i was exceedingly desirous that all the surroundings of iranistan should accord with the beauty and completeness of that place I was never a victim to that mania which possesses many men of even moderate means to own everything that joins them, and I knew that Iranistan would so increase the value of surrounding property that none but first-class residences would be possible in the vicinity. But there was other work to do, which, while affording advantageous approaches to my property, would at the same time be a lasting benefit to the public and so I opened Iranistan Avenue and other broad and beautiful streets through land which I freely purchased and as freely gave to the public, and these highways are now the most convenient as well as charming in the city. To have opened all these new avenues in their entire length at my own cost and through my own ground would have required a confirmation of Miss Lavinia Warren's opinion that what little of the city of bridgeport and the adjacent town of fairfield was not owned by general tom thumb belonged to p t barnum it is true that apart from my east bridgeport property i became a very large owner of real estate on the other side of the river in bridgeport proper and in fairfield my purchases in fairfield lying on and so near to the boundary line division street as virtually to be in bridgeport everywhere through my own lands i laid out and threw open to the public streets of generous width which distinguished the old king's roads in the colonies before grasping farmers and others encroached upon and fenced in as private property land that really belonged to the public forever and on both sides of every avenue i laid out and planted a profusion of elms and other trees in this way i have opened miles of new streets and have planted thousands of shade trees in bridgeport for i think there is much wisdom in the advice of the laird of dumby dykes in scott's heart of midlothians who sensibly says when ye hae nothing else to do ye may be a sticking in a tree it will be growing when you're sleeping but in establishing new streets too often when i had gone through my own land the project came literally to an end some old fogey blocked the way my way his own way and the highway and all i could do would be to jump over his field and continue my new street through land i might own on the other side till i reached the desired terminus in the end or continuation of some other street or till unhappily i came to a dead standstill at the ground of some other old fogey who like the original owners of what is now the shore-front of seaside park did not believe there was money to be made by giving away their property and this is the manner in which these old fogies talked we don't believe in these improvements of barnum's what's the use of them we can get to the city by the old road or street as we have done for forty years the new street will cut the pasture or mowing lot in two 
and make a checkerboard of the farm. It was bad enough to have the railroad go through, and we would have prevented that if we could, but this new street business is all bosh. And then, singularly enough, every old fogey would wind up with, I declare, I believe the whole thing is only to benefit Barnum, so that he can sell land, which he bought anywhere from sixty to two hundred dollars an acre, at the rate of five thousand dollars an acre, in building lots, as he is actually doing to-day. It is strange indeed that these men who could see the benefit to Barnum's property, by opening new streets which would immediately convert cheap farm and pasture land, into choice and high-priced building lots should not see that precisely the same thing would proportionally increase the value of their own property conservatism may be a good thing in the state or in the church but it is fatal to the growth of cities and the conservative notions of old fogies make them indifferent to the requirements which a very few years in the future will compel and blind to their own best interests such men never look beyond the length of their noses and consider every investment a dead loss unless they can get the sixpence profit into their pockets before they go to bed my own long training and experience as a manager impelled me to carry into such private enterprises as the purchase of real estate that best and most essential managerial quality of instantly deciding not only whether a venture was worth undertaking but what all things considered that venture would result in almost any man can see how a thing will begin but not every man is gifted with the foresight to see how it will end or how with the proper effort it may be made to end in east bridgeport where we had no conservatives to contend with we were only a few years in turning almost tenantless farms into a populous and prosperous city on the other side of the river while the opening of new avenues the planting of shade trees and the building of many houses have afforded me the highest pleasures of my life i confess that not a few of my greatest annoyances have been occasioned by the opposition of those who seemed to be content to simply vegetate through their existence and who looked upon me as a restless reckless innovator because i was trying to remove the moss from everything around them and even from their own eyes in the summer of eighteen sixty seven the health of my wife continuing to decline her physician directed that she should remove nearer to the seashore and as she felt that the care of a large establishment like lindencroft was more than she could bear i sold that place i have already spoken of my building of this residence it was emphatically a labor of love all that taste and money could do was fairly lavished upon lindencroft so that when all was finished it was not only a complete house in all respects but it was a perfect home and a home i meant it to be in every and the best sense of the word for my declining years consequently from basement to attic everything was constructed by day's work in the most perfect manner possible convenience and comfort were first consulted and thereafter with no attempt at ostentation elegance pure and simple predominated and permeated everywhere no first-class house in the metropolis was more replete with all that goes to constitute a complete dwelling-place under this new roof i gathered my library my pictures my souvenirs of travel in other lands and assembled my household gods while the surrounding grounds adorned with statuary and fountains displayed also in the walks the arbors the lawns the garden the piled-up rocks even the profusion of trees and shrubbery and the wealth of rare and beautiful flowers my wife's exquisite taste which in times past had made the grounds of our loved and lost iranistan so celebrated as well as charming it was hard indeed to tear ourselves from this fascinating spot but there are times when even the charms of home must be sacrificed to the claims of health lindencroft was sold july one eighteen sixty seven and we immediately removed for a summer sojourn to a small farmhouse adjoining seaside park during the hot days of the next three months we found the delightful sea breeze so bracing and refreshing that the season passed like a happy dream and we resolved that our future summers should be spent on the very shore of long island sound 
i did not however perfect my arrangements in time to prepare my own summer residence for the ensuing season and during the hot months of eighteen sixty eight we resided in a new and very pretty house i had just completed on state street in bridgeport and which i subsequently sold as i intended doing when i built it but towards the end of the summer i added by purchase to the mallet farm adjoining seaside park a large and beautiful hickory grove which seemed to be all that was needed to make the site exactly what i desired for a summer residence it will be remembered that i bought this mallet farm not for myself but so that a portion of it could be devoted to the public park and a generous slice having been thus given away there were several acres remaining which were admirably adapted to one or more residences and the purchase of the grove property made the location nearly perfect but there was a vast deal to do in grading and preparing the ground in opening new streets and avenues as approaches to the property and in setting out trees near the proposed site of the house so that ground was not broken for the foundation till october i planned a house which should combine the greatest convenience with the highest comfort keeping in mind always that houses are made to live in as well as to look at and to be homes rather than mere residences so the house was made to include abundant room for guests with dressing rooms and baths to every chamber water from the city throughout the premises gas manufactured on my own ground and that greatest of all comforts a semi-detached kitchen so that the smell as well as the secrets of the cuisine might be confined to its own locality the stables and gardens were located far from the mansion on the opposite side of one of the newly opened avenues so that in the immediate vicinity of the house on either side and before both fronts stretched large lawns broken only by the grove single shade trees rock work walks flower beds and drives the whole scheme as planned was faithfully carried out in less than eight months the first foundation stone was laid in october eighteen sixty eight and we moved into the completed house in june following in eighteen sixty nine it required a regiment of faithful laborers and mechanics and a very considerable expenditure of money to accomplish so much in so short a space of time those who saw a comparatively barren waste thus suddenly converted to a blooming garden and by the successful transplanting and judicious placing of very large and full-grown forest trees made to seem like a long settled place considered the creation of my new summer home almost a work of magic but there is no magic when determination and dollars combine to achieve a work when we moved into this new residence we formally christened the place waldemir literally but not so euphoniously waldemir woods by the sea for i preferred to give this native child of my own conception an american name of my own creation on the same estate and fronting the new avenue i opened between my own property and the public park i built at the same time two beautiful cottages one of which is known as the petrel's nest and the other occupied by my eldest daughter mrs thompson and my youngest daughter mrs seeley as a summer residence is called wavewood from the east front of waldemere across the sloping lawn and through the reaches of the grove these cottages are in sight and before the three residences stretches the broad sound with nothing to cut off the view and nothing intervening but the western portion of seaside park seaside and sea breezes however do not include the sum of rural felicities in summer and so i still keep possession of the fine farm which years ago was the scene of the elephant ploughing feats on this property which is in charge of a judicious farmer i have some very fine imported stock including several head of the celebrated white blanket dutch cattle which excite the curiosity and attract the attention of all who see them these cattle are black with a distinctly defined white blanket around their bodies giving them a very unique appearance and when they struck my fancy in holland some years ago i imported several of them nor is their singular appearance their best recommendation for they are excellent milkers 
and my dairy and farm products keep my table constantly supplied with fresh fruits and vegetables, poultry, and that choicest of country luxuries, pure cream. Amid such comforts, advantages, and luxuries, the summer months speed swiftly and sweetly by. My well-supplied stables afford the means of enjoying the numberless delightful drives which abound in the vicinity, and my salt-water-loving friend, Mr. George A. Wells, is always ready to minister to the pleasure of myself or my guests by tendering the use of anything in his sound fleet, from a rowboat to a yacht. The five months in the year which I devote to rural rest seem all too short for the enjoyment which is necessarily compressed in the twenty weeks, but I can feel at the end of the season that it is a consolidation as well as compression, not only of pleasure, but of capital, in the way of health and vigor for the winter's campaign of city living and metropolitan excitement. For, at my time of life, and especially for a man who has had so much to do with the metropolitan million as I have done, I am convinced that the city is the most congenial residence during the cooler season of the year. No matter how active may have been one's life, as a man grows older, if he does not become a little lazy, he at least learns to crave for comfortable ease and seeks for quiet. To such a man, the city in winter extends numberless pleasures. There is a sense of satisfaction even in the well-cleared sidewalks after a snowstorm and an almost selfish happiness in looking out upon a storm from a well-warmed library or parlor window. One loves to find the morning papers, fresh from the press, lying upon the breakfast table and the city is the center of attractions in the way of operas, concerts, picture galleries, libraries, the best music, the best preaching, the best of everything in aesthetical enjoyments. Having made up my mind to spend seven months of every year in the city, in the summer of 1867 I purchased the elegant and most eligibly situated mansion, number 438 Fifth Avenue, corner of 39th Street, at the crowning point of Murray Hill in New York, and moved into it in November. My residence therein in the winter season has fully confirmed my impressions in its favor. The house is replete with all that can constitute a pleasant home, and the location is so near to Central Park that we spend hours of every fine day in that great pleasure ground. While I am in town, it is scarcely more than once or twice a week that I take pains to ascertain by personal observation that I am living on the edge of a toiling, excited city of a million inhabitants. My pecuniary interests in Connecticut and in New York occupy my attention sufficiently to keep me from ennui and an extended correspondence, for which I do not yet feel the need of a private secretary, employs an hour or more of every day. I have had letters from New Zealand and other remote quarters of the globe, respecting curiosities and addressed simply to Mr. Barnum, America, and the post office officials, knowing of no other Barnum who would be likely to receive letters from such out-of-the-way places, regularly put these vaguely addressed letters in my New York box. Yet I suppose that not less than two-thirds of all the letters I receive are earnest petitions for pecuniary aid. This begging letter business began to persecute me as long ago as the time of the Jenny Lind engagement, and even before. Many of these letters ask money as a free gift, and some of them demand assistance, while others request temporary loans or invite me to furnish the capital for enterprises which are certain to bring the richest returns to all concerned therein. When I was traveling with Jenny Lind, I received a letter from a woman in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, who informed me that she had named her just-born boy and girl twins, P.T. Barnum and Jenny Lynn, coolly adding that we might send $5,000 for their immediate wants and make such provision for their future education and support as might be determined upon at the proper time. In some of these letters, the amusement afforded by the orthography and grammar was almost a compensation for the annoyance and impudence of the requests. One very bad speller, referring me to a former employer of the letter writer, wrote, I can refer you to him. Another, urging his petition, declared, God knows I am poor, 
and not long ago I received a communication from an old man who claimed to be too decrepit to earn a support, but he urged that he was a religious man and added, I take great pleasure in reading my Bible, especially the prophets, and it did look a little as if he had a sharp eye to the prophets. I have said but little in these pages of the immediate circle which is nearest and dearest to me. My wife, with whom I have lived so many happy years, and who has been my support in adversity and my solace in prosperity, still survives. Our children are all daughters. Carolyn C., the eldest, was married to Mr. David W. Thompson, October 19, 1852. Helen M., my second daughter, was married to Mr. Samuel H. Hurd, October 20, 1857. Frances J., the third daughter, was born May 1, 1842, and died April 11, 1844. And Pauline T., the fourth daughter, was married on her birthday, March 1, 1866, to Mr. Nathan Seeley. For my eldest daughter, I built and furnished a beautiful house on ground near Iranistan, and she moved into it immediately after her marriage, though of late years she has resided in New York in winter and in bridgeport in summer for helen and pauline i bought and furnished handsome houses in lexington avenue in new york within a short distance of my own city residence in fifth avenue a fine young rising generation of my grandchildren is growing up around them and me i have written as little as might be too about my religious principles and profession because i agree with a man who in answer to the pressing inquiry declared that he had no religion to speak of and i believe with him that true religion is more a matter of work than of words when i am in the city i regularly attend the services and preaching of the rev dr e h chapin and i usually go to the meetings of the same denomination in bridgeport he builds too low who builds beneath the skies and i can truly say that i have always felt my entire dependence upon him who is the dispenser of all adversity as well as the giver of all good with a natural proclivity to look upon the bright side of things i am sure that under some of the burdens the jerome entanglement for instance which have borne so heavily upon me i should have been tempted as others have been to suicide if i had supposed that my troubles were brought upon me by mere blind chance i knew that i deserved what i received i had placed too much confidence in your money and my own personal efforts i was too much concerned in material prosperity and i felt that the blow was wisely intended for my ultimate benefit a chastening which like the husks to the prodigal son should cause me to come to myself and teach me the lesson that there is something infinitely better than money or position or worldly prosperity in our father's house and i should be ungrateful indeed if on my birthday this fifth of july eighteen sixty nine when i enter upon my sixtieth year in full health and vigor with the possibility of many happy days to come i did not reverently recognize the beneficent hand that has crowned me with so many comforts and surrounded me with so many blessings it is on this day in my own beautiful home of waldemere that i write these concluding lines which record a long and busy career with the sincere hope that my experiences if not my example will benefit my fellow men end of chapter forty seven recording by nancy cochran gergen gilbert arizona Appendix Part 1 of Struggles and Triumphs, or Forty Years Recollections of P. T. Barnum, written by himself. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Struggles and Triumphs of P. T. Barnum appendix part one 
every one knows the story of the emperor charles v his ambition gratified to satiety in the conquest of kingdoms and the firm establishment of his empire he craved rest he abdicated his throne retired from business content to live on his laurels in the peaceful shades of the cloister at Yestri. the tradition is that here he forgot the world without withdrew in thought as in person from the cares and turmoils of state and found rest and cheerfulness by alternating his devotions with the tinkering of clocks perhaps every one is not so familiar with the somewhat recent correction by mr sterling of this romantic story in fact the emperor was never so restless as when he was taking rest was never so full of the perplexities of empire as when in due form he had shaken them off in the cloister he was the same man that he was in the camp and the court and when he sought to repress his energies they simply tormented him not denying that my egotism is equal to a good deal i must beg my readers not to suppose that i assume for my own history a very extended similarity to that of the greatest monarch of his time in fact the points of difference are quite as striking as those of resemblance it is true we both tried the clock business but i must claim that my tinkering in that way throws that of the empire entirely in the shade i was not however fool enough to go into a cloister let not an illustration any more than a parable run on all fours but i want a royal illustration and the history of charles v in the particular of abdicating for rest i find very pertinent to my own experience i took a formal and as i then supposed a last adieu of my readers on my fifty-ninth birthday i was as i had flattered myself through with travel with adventure and with business save so far as the care of my competence would require my attention my book closed without a suspicion that in any subsequent edition more of the same sort would make possible an additional chapter it is with a sense of surprise and with all a feeling akin to the ludicrous that in this new edition i cannot bring my career up to my sixty-second year without filling a few more pages in their contents not unlike in kind to those which make the bulk of my book as stated on page seven hundred and sixty-eight my final retirement from the managerial profession closed with the destruction of my museum by fire march third eighteen sixty eight but when i wrote that sentence i had not learned by a three years cessation of business how utterly fruitless it is to attempt to chain down energies which are peculiar to my nature no man not similarly situated can imagine the ennui which seizes such a nature after it has lain dormant for a few months having nothing to do i thought at first was a very pleasant as it was to me an entirely new sensation i would like to call on you in the summer if you have any leisure in bridgeport said an old friend i am a man of leisure and thankful i have nothing to do so you cannot call a miss i replied with an immense degree of self-satisfaction where is your office downtown when you live in new york asked another friend i have no office i proudly replied i have done work enough and shall play the rest of my life i don't go downtown once a week but i ride in the park every day and am at home much of the time i am afraid that i chuckled often 
when i saw rich merchants and bankers driving to their offices on a stormy morning while i looking complacently from the window of my cosy library said to myself let it snow and blow there's nothing to call me out to-day but nature will assert herself reading is pleasant as a pastime writing without any special purpose soon tires a game of chess will answer as a condiment lectures concerts operas and dinner parties are well enough in their way but to a robust healthy man of forty years active business life something else is needed to satisfy sometimes like a the truant schoolboy i found all my friends engaged and i had no playmate i began to fill my house with visitors and yet frequently we spent evenings quite alone without really perceiving what the matter was time hung on my hands and i was ready to lecture gratuitously for every charitable cause that i could benefit then i who had travelled so many years that almost all cities seemed to me as the same old brick and mortar began now to think i would like to travel in the autumn of eighteen sixty nine after my family had moved for the winter from bridgeport to our new york residence an english friend came with his eldest daughter to america especially to visit me this friend was mr john fish and he is an old friend of the reader also for he is the enterprising cotton mill proprietor of bury england fully described in chapter thirty two of this book in which he is mentioned as mr wilson when i was writing that chapter i had no authority to append his real name to the faithful photograph of the man but mr fish gives me his consent to use it now i need not say how pleased i was to see my friend and how happy i was to show a re representative englishman whatever was worth seeing in the metropolis and elsewhere in the united states after enjoying the christmas and new year festivities in new york taking numerous drives in our beautiful central park including several sleigh rides which to them were real novelties going the rounds of the metropolitan amusements and doing the city in general and in detail my english friends wanted to see more of the new world and i was just in the humor to act as the exhibitor in fact i now resumed my old business of systematically organizing an extensive traveling expedition and almost unconsciously became a showman of natural curiosities on a most magnificent scale we first went to niagara falls going by the hudson river and central railroads and returning by way of the erie i saw these scenes through the eyes of my english friends and took a special pleasure in witnessing their surprise and delight as they extolled the beautiful hudson the stream looked lovelier than ever the catskill mountains were higher to me than ever before for the same reason albany syracuse and rochester were more lively than usual the mammoth international hotel at niagara falls looked capricious enough to beg the entire islands of great britain and the immense cataract seemed large enough to drown all the inhabitants thereof the palace cars of the erie railroad astonished my friends and gave me great satisfaction the contagion of their enthusiasm opened my eyes to marvels in spectacles which i had long dismissed as commonplace they wanted to go to cuba i had been there twice yet i readily agreed to accompany them we took steamer from new york in january eighteen seventy we had a smooth pleasant voyage and did not even know when we passed cape hatteras 
in three days we had doffed all winter clothing and arrayed ourselves in white linen three weeks were most truly enjoyed among the novel scenes of havana and the peculiar attractions of manatanzas including a visit to the new and beautiful cave a few miles from that city we made a charming visit to a coffee plantation and orange orchard another to a sugar plantation where my english friends as well as myself were shocked to see the negro slaves male and female boys and girls cutting and carrying the sugar-cane under the lash of the mounted booted and spurred spanish overseer but riding in our charming volants from that plantation to the exceedingly beautiful valley of the umuri caused us almost to forget the sad scene we had witnessed we all agreed as we stood on the east side of this almost celestial valley and witnessed the sun dropping behind the hill on whose summit the royal palms were holding up their beautiful plumes that the valley below interspersed with its cottages and streamlets and its rich tropical trees shrubs and flowers was a scene of surpassing loveliness and i was not surprised to see the tears of joy and gratitude roll down the cheeks of the young english lady i enjoyed the scene hugely but as one evidence that this pleasure was derived from the enjoyment it afforded my transatlantic friends i will say that when i was in cuba with jenny lind in eighteen fifty one i witnessed the same scene without emotion so absorbed was i in business at that time and this is a fitting opportunity for saying that in order to enjoy travelling and indeed almost anything else it is of the very first importance that it be done without care and with congenial companions we feasted upon oranges pine-apples bananas and other tropical fruits and enjoyed the warm mild days the enjoyment was no doubt enhanced or at least better appreciated by our reading of the freezing condition of our new york friends the quaint buildings and the novel manners and customs of a nation speaking a different language from our own of course are interesting for a short time we went to new orleans by steamer we stopped a few days at the st charles hotel did the city and then took passage for memphis on a steamer which was so capacious and commodious that my english friends declared that people at home would scarce believe it was a steamer a few days sail up the broad mississippi was a real treat the conversations which my english friend held with the southern planters and their manumitted slaves caused him to somewhat change his opinions in regard to the merits of our late civil war from memphis we went by rail to the mammoth cave of kentucky thence to louisville cincinnati pittsburgh harrisburg baltimore and washington a few days sojourn at the best hotel in the world the arlington a visit to all the attractions in and around our national capital including attendance at mrs president grant's levy and a talk with the president and with numerous senators and members of congress terminated our visit we then proceeded to richmond for my friend fish had a great desire to see the confederate capital and especially libby prison and castle thunder he was almost indignant when he discovered that the latter institution was a tobacco warehouse instead of being a great castellated fortress such as his imagination had pictured it from richmond we visited baltimore and philadelphia and returned to new york in april we made up a small congenial party of ladies and gentlemen and visited california via the union and central pacific railroads and here let me say that this trip is one of the most delightful i ever made 
the pullman palace cars are so convenient and comfortable that ladies and gentlemen can make the trip to california a distance of three thousand miles with no more real fatigue than they will experience in their own drawing-rooms they can dress in dishabille read lounge write converse play a social game sleep or do what they choose while a great portion of the route affords a constant succession of novel and delightful scenes to be witnessed nowhere else on the face of the earth i say emphatically that for every person who can afford it the trip to california is one that ought by all means to be made like a thing of beauty it will prove a joy forever when our party arrived at san francisco they all agreed in saying that if they were compelled to return home the next day they should feel that they were well paid for their journey in view of the strange and interesting scenes we witnessed in salt lake city a place in many respects unlike any other in the world and in fresh remembrance of the wild bold rocky mountain scenery the vast plains the wild antelope buffalo and wolves the mining districts the curious snow sheds and many other scenes and peculiar things brought to our notice i think my friends were right in their conclusions we took our journey leisurely i lectured in council bluffs in omaha and in salt lake city we stopped several days in the celebrated mormon city and as i wished without prejudice to examine into the habits customs and opinions of the mormons we put up at the townsend house a very excellent hotel kept by mr townsend a new england mormon with three or more wives one of the principal mormons an alderman and apostle had visited me in new york he devoted his time to our party for several successive days and through his courtesy and influence we were furnished facilities for obtaining information that not one stranger in a thousand ever enjoys we not only visited the tabernacle and all the institutions civil and religious but were introduced into the families of several of the dignitaries in turn we were visited at our hotel by all the principal church officers without stopping to discuss their great error plurality of wives i must say that all our party agreed that the mormons of salt lake city were an industrious quiet seemingly conscientious peaceful god-fearing people a serious defection has taken place in their church the portion called the liberals have renounced polygamy for the future and this example together with their rejection of certain theological superstitions is giving them great influence and respect this branch of the mormons is growing rapidly and i have no doubt that their influence aided by the great influx of genteels caused by the pacific railroad will soon serve in exterminating the plurality wife system unless unhappily fanatics and fools give this system renewed strength by reckless persecuting its devotees to martyrdom i lectured in the salt lake theater a large and commodious building belonging to the mormons a dozen or so of brigham young's wives and scores of his children were among the audience as i came out of the theatre one of the apostles introduced me to five of his wives in succession the mormon wives whom i visited in company of their husbands expressed themselves pleased with their positions but i confess i doubt their sincerity on this point all with whom our party conversed and some of our ladies talked with these mormon wives in secret expressed their solemn conviction that polygamy was the only true domestic system sanctioned by the almighty although they confessed they wished it was right for a man to have but one wife 
I was introduced by her father to a girl of seventeen named Barnum. The old man was an original Mormon. He had moved from Illinois with Brigham Young and his disciples when they were driven out and compelled to make that wonderful and fearful journey over the plains. The daughter was born in Salt Lake City and, of course, knew nothing of any other religion. I asked her laughingly if she expected to have the fifth part of a man for her husband. I expect I shall. I believe it is right, she replied. My apolistic friend took me to Brigham Young's house early in the morning. Mr. Young had gone to Ogden to accompany some bishops whom he was sending abroad. I left my card with his secretary and said I would call at four o'clock. But before noon, a servant from President Young brought me a message for me to call on him at one o'clock. At the hour designated, I called with my friends. Brigham Young was standing in front of one of his houses, the Beehive, in which was his reception room. He received us with a smile and invited us to enter. He was very sociable, asked us many questions, and promptly answered ours. Finally, he said with a chuckle, Barnum, what will you give to exhibit me in New York and the Eastern cities? Well, Mr. President, I replied, I'll give you half the receipts, which I will guarantee shall be $200,000 per year, for I consider you the best show in America. Why did you not secure me some years ago when I was of no consequence? He continued. Because you would not have drawn at that time, I answered. Brigham smiled and said, I would like right well to spend a few hours with you, if you could come when I am disengaged. I thanked him and told him I guessed I should enjoy it, but visitors were crowding into his reception room, and we withdrew. I subsequently met him in the street, driving his favorite pair of mules attached to a nice carriage. He raised his hat and bowed which salutation I, of course, returned. I hope that Brigham's declining years will prompt him to receive a new revelation, commanding a discontinuance of the wife plurality feature of the Mormon religion. Arriving at Sacramento, where the train stopped for half an hour, I was interviewed for the first time in my life by a newspaper reporter, on the same evening, in the excellent Cosmopolitan Hotel in San Francisco, I was again interviewed by the chief editor of a morning paper, accompanied by his reporter. By this time I had become accustomed to this business, and when the gentlemen informed me they wanted to interview me, I asked them to be seated, pulled up an extra chair on which to rest my feet, and said, Go ahead, gentlemen, I am ready. Well, they did go ahead, asking me every conceivable question on every conceivable subject. I felt jolly and spread myself. The consequence was three columns of Barnum interviewed appeared next morning with a to be continued at the bottom, and the succeeding morning appeared three columns more. This conspicuous advertisement prepared the way for a lecture I gave at Pratt's large hall, which was well attended. It took us a week to do San Francisco, with its suburbs, including Oakland, Woodward's celebrated and beautiful gardens, and Seal Rock. When I saw that small rocky island lying only ten rods off, covered with sea lions weighing from 800 to 2,000 pounds, the show fever began to rise. I offered $50,000 to have 10 of the large sea lions delivered to me alive in New York so that I could fence in a bit of the East River near Jones Wood and give such an exhibition to citizens and strangers in that city. I little thought at that time that I should subsequently expend half that sum in procuring these 
marine monsters and transport them through the country in huge water tanks as a small item in a mammoth traveling show the chinese quarters where were their shops restaurants and laundries their josh house and the chinese theatre gave us a new sensation and were quite sufficient to quench the lingering desire i had long felt to visit china and japan the chinese servants and laborers are diligent peaceable clean and required no watching when i remembered how many thousands of dollars i had paid to i servants for not doing what i had hired them to do i did not feel sorry that there was a prospect of the celestials extending their travels to the eastern states end of appendix part one recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c appendix part two of struggles and triumphs or forty years recollections of p t barnum written by himself this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c struggles and triumphs of p t barnum appendix part two while i was in san francisco a german named gabriel kahn brought me his little son literally a little one for he is a dwarf more diminutive in stature than general tom thun was when i first found him the parents of this lilliputin were anxious that i should engage and exhibit him several showmen had made them very liberal offers but they had set their hearts on having barnum bring him out and present him to the public of course i felt the compliment but was inclined to say no as i had given up the exhibition business and was a man of leisure but the marvellous mannequin was such a handsome well-formed intelligent little fellow speaking fluently both english and german and withal was so pert and so captivating that i was induced to engage him for a term of years and give him the sobriquet of admiral dot indeed he was but a dot or as the new york evening post put it the small boy of the period at any rate in the matter of growth at a very early age he came to a full stop though further in the matter of punctuation he compels an exclamation on the part of all who see him and occasions numerous interrogations i dressed the little fellow in the complete uniform of an admiral and invited the editors of the san francisco journals and also a number of ladies and gentlemen to the parlors of the cosmopolitan hotel to visit him all were astonished and delighted the newspapers stated as news the facts and gave interesting details with regard to barnum's discovery of this wonderful curiosity who had been living so long undiscovered under their very noses it was the old story of charles statton tom thumb of bridgeport over again with the new lilliputin and a new locality meanwhile i told the parents of the admiral that personally i should not exhibit their son till i returned to new york but advised them to give the san franciscans the opportunity to see him during the remaining few weeks of my stay in the golden state my friend woodward of woodward's gardens engaged the admiral for three weeks duly advertising the curious discovery by barnum of this valuable nugget further stating that he, as he would depart for the east in three weeks the only opportunity for the san francisco public to see him was then offered at the gardens immediately there was an immense furore thousands of ladies and children as well as men daily thronged the gardens saw the little wonder 
and purchased his cart to visit during the short period he remained there little dot as dots are apt to do made his mark pocketed more than a thousand dollars for himself besides drawing more than twice that sum for mr woodward moreover the extended and enthusiastic notices of the entire san francisco press gave the admiral a prestige and start which would favorably introduce him wherever he might show himself throughout the united states this originated the public exhibition of one of the handsomest most accomplished and most diminutive dwarfs of whom there is any history and the fame of the little admiral already is rapidly spreading all over the world speaking of dwarfs it may be mentioned here that notwithstanding my announced retirement from public life i still retained business connections with my old friend the well-known general tom thumb in eighteen sixty nine i joined that celebrated dwarf in a fresh enterprise which proposed an exhibition tour of him and a party of twelve with a complete outfit including a pair of ponies and a carriage entirely around the world the party was made up of general tom thumb and his wife formerly lavina warren commodore nutt and his brother rodina miss minnie warren mr sylvester bleeker and his wife and mr b s kellogg besides an advertising agent and musicians mr bleeker was the manager and mr kellogg acted as treasurer in the fall of eighteen sixty nine this little company went by the union pacific railway to san francisco stopping on the way to give exhibitions at omaha denver salt lake city and other places on the route with great success in san francisco's pratt's hall which the company occupied was crowded day and evening for several weeks every one went to see them the exhibition was profusely hand-billed and posted in chinese as well as in english and crowds of celestials went to see the smallest specimens of melicans known in that region for admiral dot living in san francisco had not then been discovered by barnum after a prolonged and most profitable series of exhibitions in san francisco the company visited several leading towns in california and then started for australia on the way they stopped at the sandwich islands and exhibited in honolulu from there they went to japan exhibiting in yeddo yokohama and other principal places and afterwards at canton and elsewhere in china they next made the entire tour of australia drawing immense houses at sydney melbourne and in other towns but they did not go to new zealand they then proceeded to the east indies giving exhibitions in the larger towns and cities receiving marked attentions from rajahs and other distinguished personages afterwards they went by the way of the suez canal to egypt and gave their entertainments at cairo and thence to italy exhibiting at all available points and arrived in great britain in the summer of eighteen seventy one notwithstanding the enormous expenses attending the transportation of this company around the world it was one of the few instances of profitably swinging round the circle the enterprise was a pecuniary success and of course the opportunity for sight-seeing enjoyed by the little general and his party was fully appreciated they travelled to see as well as to be seen fortunately they all preserved the best of health and met with no accident during the extended tour my name did not publicly appear in connection with this enterprise the exhibition was conducted under the auspices of thumb but i had a large finger in the pie mr sylvester beaker the manager wrote me from dublin december sixth eighteen seventy one a letter from which i extract the following 
if any person will perform the feat of travelling with such a company forty eight thousand nine hundred and forty six miles twenty nine thousand nine hundred miles by sea give one thousand two hundred and eighty four entertainments in four hundred and seven different cities and towns in all climates of the world without losing a single day or missing a single performance through illness or accident let them show his vouchers and i will give him the belt while i am about it i may as well confess my connection sub rosa with another little speculation during my last three years leisure i hired the well-known siamese twins the giantess anna swan and a circassian lady and in connection with judge ingles i sent them to great britain where in all the principal places and for about a year their levies were continually crowded in all probability the great success attending this enterprise was much enhanced if not actually caused by extensive announcements in advance that the main purpose of chang eng's visit to europe was to consult the most eminent medical and surgical talent with regard to the safety of separating the twins eminent surgeons in london and edinburgh examined these psychological phenomena and generally coincided in the declaration that their lives would be jeopardized and probably be forfeited if surgery should separate them of course the reports of these examinations were duly and officially made in all the leading medical and surgical journals as well as the reports of lectures delivered by surgeons who had given their personal attention to the case of the twins and these accounts in english and american journals were also translated and were widely circulated through europe as this establishment did not advertise in the new york herald i was not a little amused to see several columns of editorial matter in that sheet published a few weeks before the siamese twins sailed for europe giving elaborate scientific reasons why no attempt to separate them should be made i quite coincided with my quondam friend bennett in his conclusions as a proof of which i may state that i purchased and mailed marked copies of his editorial to all the leading newspapers and magazines abroad in most of which the matter was republished thereby affording the best of advertising and greatly increasing the receipts of the twin treasury for many months but to return to my california trip we visited the geysers and when we witnessed the bold mountain scenery through which we passed to get there and then saw and heard the puffing steaming burning bubbling acres of hot springs emitting liquids of a dozen different minerals and of as many different colors we said this would pay for coming all the way from new york if we saw nothing else and it would in returning from the geysers to calistoga we fell into the hands of the celebrated stage driver foss he had been laying for me several days and had said he would give barnum a specimen of stage driving that would astonish him he did it foss is by far the greatest stage driver of modern times the way he handles the reins seems marvellous and although he dashes his six-horse team under full gallop down the most precipitous mountain roads making one's hair continually to stand on end his horses are docile as lambs and they know every tone of foss's voice and obey accordingly i suppose that this new hampshire jehu is after all as safe a driver as ever held the ribbons calistoga lies chiefly on made ground dig down five feet and you find water wherein an egg will boil hard in five minutes a japanese tea plantation is started here with prospects of success we devoted a fortnight to visiting the great yosemite valley we went by way of mariposa 
where we saw the mariposa grove of big trees whence i sent to new york a piece of bark thirty-one inches thick that bark was taken from a tree a hundred and two feet in circumference over three hundred feet high and according to its annual layers eight hundred and thirty-seven years old the yosemite has been so often and so well described that i shall not attempt a new description suffice to say it is one of those great and real things in nature that goes in reality far beyond any previous conception from the moment i got a bird's eye view of this wonderful valley from inspiration point until a week afterwards when we mounted our horses to emerge from it i could not help oft repeating wonderful wonderful sublime indescribable incomprehensible i never before saw anything so truly an appalling grand it pays me a hundred times over for visiting california on returning to stockton i lectured for a methodist church pursuant to agreement made to that effect when i left for the yosemite twelve days before on our return we stopped at chenine and took the branch railroad to denver colorado afterwards going fifty miles by stage to the mines at georgetown golden city central city and other notable places returning from denver we stopped at a truly wonderful town of greeley where when we left home in april not ten persons resided but where was now settled the union colony this company then numbered six hundred greeley is now a city two years old containing thousands of inhabitants and increasing at a rate totally unexampled there is no community of interest here except in such public works as the irrigating canals and the school houses each inhabitant owns whatever lands and buildings he or she pays for and real estate and other property rises in value according to the increase in the number of inhabitants here are millions of acres of rich valley land which need only irrigation that the cache de podre river is giving through the canals of the union colony this model town of greeley will ever have peace and prosperity within its borders for no title can inhere to any land or building where intoxicating drinks are permitted to be sold it is a city of refuge from the curse of strong drink and to it for generations to come will whole families congregate as their paradise guarded by flaming swords of sobriety and order where they can live rationally happy and prosperously from greeley we returned to new york and my family removed to our summer quarters in bridgeport the last of june here we were visited by numerous noble friends the late alice carey spent several weeks with us at waldmere and although her health was feeble she enjoyed the cool breezes as well as the fine drives clam bakes etc for which bridgeport is specially renowned indeed my own house was the last which this good and gifted lady ever entered except her own in new york to which i accompanied her from bridgeport her sister phoebe who so quickly followed alice to the other world was also my guest at waldmere but the restless spirit of an energetic man of leisure prompted me again to travel i went with friends to montreal quebec the saginaw river and the regions round about returning by the way of saratoga springs my english friends again had occasion to open their eyes at the large union hotel and congress hall where fifteen hundred persons dine at one time and two thousand lodge under a single roof without crowding well this is a big country and you americans do everything on a big scale that's a fact was the expression for the thousandth time of my anglo-saxon companions in september i made up a party of ten 
including my english friend and we started for kansas on a grand buffalo hunt general custer commandant at fort hayes was apprised in advance of our anticipated visit and he received us like princes he fitted out a company of fifty cavalry furnishing us with horses arms and ammunition we were taken to an immense herd of buffaloes quietly browsing on the open plain we charged on them and during an exciting chase of a couple of hours we slew twenty immense bull buffaloes we might have killed as many more as we not considered it wanton butchery my friend george a wells of bridgeport who is a great hunter was one of the party and although he had slain two buffaloes he had lost himself on the prairie not only to his own dismay but to the great terror for four mortal hours of all his companions he was by no means satisfied he wanted to camp out and hunt buffaloes for several days longer another bridgeport huntsman mr james wilson was of the same mind but when the question was put to vote my english friend john fish who had made himself sore by hard riding mr charles b hotchkiss a bridgeport bank president who was quite content with killing one buffalo my right bower david w sherwood who with a single shot dropped an immense bull as he indeed now and then had done with no other weapon than his tongue david m reed a bridgeport merchant another bridgeporter theodore w downs each credited with one or two carcasses on the field and i who had brought down two and half killed another buffalo all voted that we had done enough and were in favor of returning home whereupon wells indignantly exclaimed i was invited out here for a hunt but you have made it a race but every man had killed his buffalo some had killed two and we were satisfied we had plenty of buffalo and antelope meat and on the whole our ten days sport afforded another sensation a feeling so necessary to one in my state but sensations cannot be made in order every day i am therefore taught by an experience of three years retirement from business that it is better to be moderately engaged in some legitimate occupation so long as health and energy permit if a man is regularly in harness though he may do but a small portion of the drawing he will at least so far occupy his mind as not to need spasmodic excitements hence although my worldly possessions trivial indeed in comparison with the wealth of some of america's millionaires were yet as ample as i cared to acquire nevertheless from the very necessity of my active nature in the autumn of eighteen seventy i began to prepare a great show enterprise requiring five hundred men and horses to transport and conduct it through the country selecting as manager of this gigantic enterprise mr william c coop whom i had favorably known for some years as a capital showman and a man of good judgment integrity and excellent executive ability we spent several weeks in blocking out and perfecting our course of action as one project after another involving the outlay of thousands upon thousands of dollars was laid before manager coop he began to open his eyes pretty widely and before we had been three weeks in consultation he exclaimed why mr barnum such a show as you are projecting after a while would ruin the richest man in america for the expenses would be double the receipts every day i begged mr coop not to be alarmed reminding him that i was not wholly inexperienced in the show business and that in any event i was to foot the bills it is true that the enormous expense of this vast scheme involved a greater risk than any showman had ever before dared to assume 
my main object in setting on foot this great travelling exhibition was to open a safety valve for my pent-up energies and i felt far more anxious to put before the public a grand and triumphant show than i did to add a penny to my competence end of appendix part two recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c appendix part three of struggles and triumphs or forty years recollections of p t barnum written by himself this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c struggles and triumphs of p t barnum appendix part three when my plans were made public the proprietors of the travelling shows throughout the country with scarcely an exception declared that my exhibition necessarily must prove a failure for they said no travelling show in the world ever took in one half so much money per day as barnum's daily expenses will be i knew that this was nearly true but in reply to their ill-omened prognostications i only said well but you see no show that has travelled ever drew out one half of the people i expect to attract all of them i confess i felt that my reputation for always giving my patrons more than their money's worth and also for scrupulously excluding from my exhibitions everything objectionable to the refined and morale would inevitably draw out large numbers of people who are not in the habit of attending ordinary travelling shows with these views i had confidence in my undertaking from the start and i expended money like water in order to fully carry out my intentions and desires previous business arrangements prevented my opening at the first in new york but i did the next best thing by going to the next best place for the benefit and convenience of my numerous new york friends and patrons and opened in brooklyn april tenth eighteen seventy one at the onset the exhibition was truly a mammoth one it embraced a museum menagerie caravan and hippodrome all first class and unsurpassed in previous shows and dan costello's celebrated circus was added it was an exhibition absolutely colossal exhaustive and bewildering various as the most liberal expenditure and years of experience could possibly make it my motto through life has been give the best regardless of expense my aim was to combine in the several shows more startling and entirely novel wonders in creation that were ever before seen in one collection anywhere in the world and to furnish my patrons with wholesome instruction and innocent amusement without the taint of anything that should seem immoral or exceptionable in all this i fully succeeded and i declare with pride that this grand combination has proved to be the crowning success of my managerial life my canvas covered about three acres of ground and would hold nearly ten thousand people yet from the start in brooklyn and throughout the entire summer tour it was of daily occurrence that from one thousand to three thousand people were turned away after an extraordinarily successful week in brooklyn i visited all the leading places in the immediate vicinity then the principal towns in connecticut next through rhode island to boston how the great combination was received and appreciated in the athens of america 
is well set forth in the following extracts from a two-column article in the boston journal the arrival in boston last monday of barnum's new enterprise comprising a museum menagerie caravan and hippodrome to which is gratuitously added dan costello's mammoth circus has produced a sensation in this city never before equalled by any amusement enterprise known to new england we have had our anniversaries reviews parades the odd fellows and to-day shall have fisk's famous ninth but after all nothing seems equal or eclipse the great barnum and his immense amusement enterprise which is the theme of universal comment and observation here as elsewhere have you seen barnum is the question that is heard in the streets counting houses stores and shops the public being as anxious to see the veteran show king as they are to visit his big show we confess that barnum is a curiosity and always has been for the last thirty years during which time he has figured prominently before the american people until the fame of him is as familiar to both worlds as household words verily who has not heard of p t barnum and the famous american museum we don't mean that as a specimen of the genus homo barnum is very different from other specimens who have gained no notoriety and success but simply as an embodiment of the very best representative type of a shrewd enterprising wide awake american who has achieved an immense success in his specialty as the greatest amusement caterer of the nineteenth century though two disastrous conflagrations his immense museum collection in new york however the accumulations of half a century were in a single day almost entirely swept out of existence this was a serious loss to the public as it was to mr barnum though he, he is said to have taken it as coolly and as imperturbably as the apple woman round the corner would the loss of a roxbury russet already advancing in years and thinking no doubt he had served the public long enough mr barnum concluded after the loss of his museum to retire permanently from the show business and taking horace greeley's advice go a-fishing or seek the shades of a more quiet and private life for the balance of his days a man however like p t barnum who has spent a whole life amid scenes of bustle and excitement with a constant tension of muscle and brain catering for the ever-recurring demands of a curious public naturally fond of amusements especially the marvellous and sensational is rarely satisfied to withdraw suddenly like the tortoise within his own shell and let the outside world wag without taking an active interest in passing events thus mr barnum's retirement although surrounded by every luxury that money could furnish became the veriest prison to every element nervous physical and intellectual of his being and it is no wonder under these circumstances that he became absolutely restive under rest his ambition like ancient utica he felt to be too much pent up and as volcanoes blow ere they disembogue so smoke betrays the wild consuming fire like dan costello's famous gymnast his vaulting ambition has fairly o'leaped himself for a simple bound he comes before the public in a new role having on his hands an elephant 
more ponderous and expensive to manage than the famous quadruped that used to be seen ploughing on his bridgeport farm not for agricultural purposes exactly but as a rocket thrown up to attract public attention to my broadway american museum about a year ago mr barnum desirous to do good in his day and generation instituted and put on wheels his present mammoth enterprise at a cost of nearly three quarters of a million dollars which has met with a success unparalleled in the annals of the show business this success is so sudden and complete as to astonish everybody and none more so than professionals themselves knowing the interest the public feels in all that pertains to p t barnum and especially his last great effort barnum himself calls it his last great splurge which we readily grant in deference to his known modesty we sent one of our reporters to interview the whole affair and as his injunctions were imperative to stick to facts fiat justica ruet condum our readers shall be able to judge of the big show as it appeared one thing is very evident since starting from new york barnum's show has been patronized by the largest concourse of people ever known in new england his transit across the country has been like sherman's march to the sea while his entertainments have been visited by the great masses including eminent clergymen and their families and the most respectable of all persuasions in fact by everybody without reference to race color or previous condition etc barnum Groot's great possession which made its first appearance in the streets last monday is one of the grandest and most magnificent pageants of the kind that ever appeared in boston the great cortege is varied and almost interminable in length the cages chariots carriages and vans no two being painted or finished alike are of unique workmanship elaborate design and gorgeously painted and gilded the models inscribed on the cages are peculiarly curt and barnumish the massively carved chariot called the temple of juno which in construction is somewhat telescopic that is let up and down to the extent of thirty feet or more by means of machinery is of solid carved work gilt all over with the precious metals and studded profusely with plated mirrors which give to the tableau a truly gorgeous and magnificent effect upon an elevated seat just beneath a rich and a unique oriental canopy of the most elaborate finish sits in perfect nonchalance the representative queen surrounded by gods and goddesses in mythological costume giving a striking picture of an oriental pageant as seen in the days of the roman empires this gorgeous car built in london expressly for barnum is forty feet high and is rendered picturesque in effect by the team of elephants camels and dromedaries which lead or escort the van the entire procession is the longest and most varied ever witnessed here and consisted of about seventy cages wagons and chariots and two hundred and fifty horses but let us follow this grand street demonstration to the ground selected for the great exposition for we are a little anxious to know what becomes of so many horses wagons housings traps and paraphernalia in general the lot on which the three colossal tents are pitched 
presently a really novel and interesting sight from two or three acres of land are required for this purpose of exhibition hotel canvassery curie horse tents etc immediately after returning from the pageant all cages containing the live white animals and all the museum curiosities are driven under the spacious tents and arranged in regular order those containing the animals being arranged in the caravan and menagerie while the others are classified in the museum department the horses are detached from the cages dens and chariots by experienced grooms and immediately removed to eight long rows of horse tents which are located in a separate lot containing about thirty horses each these being principally draft and baggage horses as the rink stock is conveyed to hotel and livery stables of the two hundred and forty five people connected with this varied show two-thirds were employed in getting their breakfast the establishment is equipped with portable stoves and accomplished cooks the meals are served in large tents and in this way all the attaches but the artists are fed everything connected with the enterprise is first class a fact which strikes one turn which way he will not only is everything done for the comfort and convenience of the people engaged with it but the same thoughtfulness is manifested on behalf of the horses whether used for draught purposes or as accessories to the erinic performances the tents in which the horses are kept are large and an ample room is assigned to each animal in fact they are complete stables with patent managers and all the modern stable appointments the best rye straw is used for bedding and never were horses provided better with the little notions which certainly contribute to their comfort and which are probably in exact accordance with a horse's idea of good living a veterinary surgeon is regularly employed and the health of the horses is we have reason to believe much closer looked after than the health of many people is by their family physician the wagons used for the conveyance of baggage when the company is moving are converted into sleeping rooms at night by letting down shelves which when equipped with bedding and blankets form very comfortable berths each wagon accommodates twelve persons another feature worthy of notice is the manner in which the baggage is carried if each person carried a saratoga of course it would require some fifty wagons to carry the trunks to obviate this difficulty the clothing and other personal effects of the employees are kept in one large wagon the possessions of each one are numbered this wagon is in charge of a clerk who has reduced his business to a science and with the same skill that a photographer picks out your old negative from among a thousand others when you order an additional dozen carts de visite the gentleman can produce the article called for at a moment's notice having satisfied ourselves that barnum's numerous employees know how to groom their stock as well as how to keep a hotel we will now take our readers with us to the great show the doors of which are by this time opened of course they must buy their own tickets for the management are not in the habit of papering their house rather than play to empty benches and we shall see whether phineas has kept faith with the public for we have a glittering recollection that he promised not long ago to make this 
last great effort the crowning success of his managerial life which we are of course bound to believe although we have also a sort of inquisitive penchant to look for the proofs already the masses of curious sightseers are occupying every foot of available ground the three ticket wagons being literally besieged from which the necessary cards of admission are being rapidly distributed at fifty cents per head for adults children half price and very soon the three colossal tents are full to overflowing with anxious spectators the first impression that one receives on entering is that of bewilderment such as the magnitude extent variety and uniqueness of the combination here in almost endless variety we see gathered together from all parts of the earth a miniature representation of the wonder world that nobody but barnum would ever have thought of securing for a travelling exhibition then follows in the same article a detailed account of the leading attractions which want of space precludes me from copying the notice concludes as follows with all these unique and bewildering attractions our faith has been wonderfully increased and we shall no longer doubt why it is that p t barnum is the happiest and most successful show proprietor that ever came before the american public and no man more than he deserves as he is constantly receiving their unstinted and unprecedented patronage the great show is now on its triumphant tour through northern new england and will no doubt be visited by myriads everywhere as it has been here and elsewhere from boston my exhibition went through new hampshire and into maine as far as waterville why the show did not go to towns beyond in that state is fully and amusingly explained in the following which appeared in the new york tribune august nineteenth eighteen seventy one barnum's merangerie and circus one of the greatest successes ever achieved in the annals of the sawdust ring has been accomplished the present season by p t barnum's museum menagerie and circus from the inception of the enterprise success has crowned its efforts mr barnum's name in itself has been a tower of strength and to his direction and general control its success is due there are a few men that have the courage to invest nearly five hundred thousand dollars in so precarious a business and to run it at a daily expense of nearly twenty five hundred dollars but mr barnum had faith in the public would respond liberally to his appeal one great secret of his success has been ever to give the public a great deal for their money and to fix the prices of admission as popular rates but we doubt if he expected so great a success as has recently in the state of maine been showered upon him it is worthy of being recorded as equal to jenny lynn's triumphal american tour it has originally been the intention to make a tour with the great show as far east as bangor maine and it was so announced but subsequently they found that there were many bridges over which it was impossible for the large chariots to pass and that the show would be obliged to make stands at several small towns en route which could not possibly pay the running expenses even if every inhabitant attend consequently it was decided that lewiston maine should be the terminus of their eastern tour 
the following letter dated winthrop maine june thirtieth from a correspondent will best convey the idea of the great interest and enthusiasm there manifested by the people the business in maine has been immense contrary to the predictions of the showmen generally since entering the state except at brunswick where it rained hard all day they have been compelled to show three times daily to accommodate the vast crowds that have flocked from every direction while exhibiting at gardenier and augusta persons came all the way from bangor when they reached waterville a scene occurred which has never been equalled in this or any other country the village was crowded with people who had come from the surrounding country many of them travelling a distance of seventy-five miles and all the morning crowds were pouring in from all points of the compass in carriages wagons ox-carts and on foot near the circus tents in an adjoining field were several large tents pitched which had served to shelter the people the previous night who had come long distance and encamped there the authorities of the village had taken the precaution to stop the sale of all the spiritous liquors during that day and had caused barrels of water and plenty of ice to be placed at the street corners for the free use of all carts were provided at the expense of the village to constantly replenish the barrels the early morning performance was commenced and it was found that they could not accommodate a tithe part of their patrons and ere its close an excursion train of twenty-seven cars crowded in every part came in from bangor closely followed by another of seventeen cars from belfast seeing this vast accession to the already large numbers of visitors the manager was somewhat puzzled how to accommodate them finally it was decided to give a continuous exhibition giving an act in the circus department every few moments this style of performance was kept up without cessation until nine o'clock in the evening when a heavy shower of rain falling afforded the manager an excuse to close the exhibitions the men and horses were completely exhausted and their next drive being forty-eight miles to lewiston where they were to exhibit three times they shipped all the ring horses by railroad to give them an opportunity for much needed rest on driving out of augusta on july twenty ninth they narrowly escaped an accident similar to the one which happened in new jersey one of the passenger wagons with twelve passengers and having four horses attached had driven down a steep hill when suddenly they came upon a locomotive crossing the road immediately in front of them the driver with great presence of mind suddenly pulled the horses to the right making an abrupt turn which overturned the wagon breaking the arm of mr summerfield one of the business men bruising several others and injuring somewhat severely joseph the french giant who was compelled to remain behind the show for a couple of days from maine we went across vermont exhibiting in the more important places to albany and troy at albany it was impossible to secure a suitable locality for the exhibition short of a distance of two miles from the city yet here distance seemed literally to lend enchantment to the view for every exhibition was thronged and here as everywhere thousands were turned away who were unable to find room our route from albany was along the line of the new york central railroad 
to buffalo and back by the erie railway to the hudson river exhibiting nearly everywhere and after exhibitions at catskill Poughkeepsie, and newburgh returning to new york our tour through the country was more than a carnival it was a perfect ovation and best of all the public and the press with one accord pronounced the exhibition even better and greater than i had advertised at the close of the travelling season i desired to exhibit my great show to my new york patrons and to return again to the metropolis where in days gone by the children the parents and the grandparents of the present generation have flocked in millions to my museum accordingly i secured the empire rank immediately after the close of the american institute fair and opened in that building november thirteenth eighteen seventy one at least ten thousand people were present and in response to an enthusiastic welcoming call i made a few remarks the report of which i copy from the next morning's new york world a popular eastern poet has said the noblest art a human being can acquire is the power of giving happiness to others i sincerely hope this is true my highest ambition during the last thirty years has been to make the public happy when i introduced the swedish nightingale jenny lind to the american public in eighteen fifty one a thrill of pleasure was felt throughout the land by our most refined and intellectual citizens as well as by every lover of melody in the humblest walks of life as a museum proprietor for nearly thirty years i catered successfully to the pleasures of many millions of persons nor have my efforts been confined to this continent as a public exhibitor i have appeared before kings queens and emperors in the old world and have given gratification to many millions of their devoted subjects fifty years ago some moralists taught that it was wicked to laugh but all divines of the present day have abandoned that untenable and austere position and now almost universally agree that laughter is not only conducive to health but very proper and to be encouraged for as the bard of avon justly says with mirth and laughter let old wrinkles come in fact mr beecher permits laughing in his church holding that it is a right to laugh as to cry it has been said that i have caused more people to laugh than any other man on this continent ten years ago one of our first families in fifth avenue were conversing regarding the duties responsibilities and trials of this life their little daughter of seven was present the father remarked that it was a pretty hard world to live in full of struggles labors toils and disappointments the mother added that there was much poverty and suffering in the world etc but the little girl chipped in well i think it is a beautiful and pleasant world i have my dear mamma and papa and my good grandma there besides i have barnum's museum to go to and surely i don't want a happier world than this my great object has been to elevate the standard of amusements to render them instructive as well as amusing to divest them of all vulgar and immoral tendencies and to make all my exhibitions worthy the patronage of the best and most respectable families finally my great desire has been to give my patrons ten times the worth of their money and in this my last 
crowning effort to overshadow and totally eclipse all other exhibitions in the world end of appendix part three recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c appendix part four of struggles and triumphs or forty years recollections of p t barnum written by himself this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c struggles and triumphs of p t barnum appendix part four and the metropolitan press people and patronage combined only repeated with more emphasis the universal testimony of the country as to the extent and merits of this great show want of space permits me to copy only two or three of the favorable articles which appeared from day to day during the entire exhibition in the columns of the new york press the following is from the baptist union rare curiosities mr p t barnum has organized at the empire rink a very large exhibition combining a museum menagerie international zoological garden polytechnic institute and hippodrome having examined the various departments of this vast combination we do not hesitate to recommend our friends to go with their families to visit it and they will enjoy a treat seldom offered in a lifetime the department of natural history is especially excellent and interesting and embraces the largest and rarest collection of wild animals ever exhibited together in this or probably in any other country everything connected with the entertainments admirably harmonizes with the good taste and respectability which give to all of mr barnum's enterprises a refinement and morality which commend them to the most scrupulous the great hippodrome pageant in which appear so many elephants camels dromedaries horses and ponies with men women and children in costumes representing the arabs and bedonians of the desert roman knights heralds warriors kings princes and bashaws of the olden time is truly interesting and grand and is worth going a long distance to see that popular religious journal the new york christian leader edited by rev g h emerson speaks as follows a good sermon for showmen the success which everywhere attends barnum's great show ought to be evidence to the managers who furnish amusement to the public that profanity and indecency of speech and gesture all of which mr barnum excludes by promptly and indignantly discharging the offender are not of the nature and supply meeting a popular demand if a man is coarse and vulgar himself he usually has manhood enough left not to take his wife and children where coarseness and vulgarity are sure to be witnessed mr barnum's combination is now doing for canvas what his jenny lynn enterprise did for public halls its patrons are not individuals but communities for example the factories of patterson new jersey were compelled to suspend the operative population having left en masse for the show but this swimming and unsurpassed success would come to a full stop in one day if 
profanity and indecency instead of being rigorously forbidden were encouraged the community at large respects decency the show bewildering various and mammoth beyond a precedence is now on its way through new england in one sense like sherman's march to the sea and a patronage never before anticipated is organized in advance it is big and better still it is clean clean to the eye and to the moral sense nim crinkle the dramatic critic of the new york world wrote a very entertaining column about the show for that journal and trinculo copied it in full in the amusements gossip of the new york leader the following is extracted from the article barnum's universal show barnum who long ago beat all creation is now exhibiting his spoils at the rink animated nature and animated art make a stunning combination especially when the combination is all in active operation as it generally is about two o'clock in the afternoon and eight o'clock in the evening then one can enjoy the howls of the animals the rush and scurry of the arena the rattle bang of the band and the delight of ten thousand people without stopping to discriminate it is something for the veteran showman to say he has been able to stir the metropolis with his caravan as other and less indifferent villages are stirred by smaller shows the combination as shows are rated is really an extraordinary one and when it arrives at an average western city it doubles the population for them contributing of its own multitudinous teamsters tricksters and stirrers up about three hundred people with as many more ravening beasts thrown in the first living curiosity that one meets at the rink is barnum himself uncaged he still holds to the notion that it is worth fifty cents to look at him and one dollar to read his life and as nearly everybody has looked at him and read his life we presume the rest of the world agrees with him still it is curious to observe how the healthy and hearty world thronging to see the monkeys and the mermaids mingle awe with their admiration of the greatest curiosity of all they are subdued by a sense of the showman's power they skirt carefully round the edges of his greatness so as not to attract too much of his attention for who could tell what a moment if he so choose he would exhibit them we say the healthy and hearty world for of course the unhealthy and deformed world which we all know was made to be exhibited throngs as of old in supplicating procession after him three-legged women and four-legged men and double-headed children may be seen at all hours congregating on the third avenue in the vicinity of the rink seeking audience of the great showman indeed the observant traveller on this great thoroughfare we know hours before he gets to the rink that he is approaching barnum by the strange monotrocities woolly horses albino children and living skeletons that will be observed wending their way from all parts of the world to the great show in hope of getting engagements of course 
all this adds to the excitement and interest of the eager multitude but the animals and curiosities inside constitute the real attraction to the public and a very fine collection of animals it is the eight or ten royal abyssinian and babylonian lions roar less like suckling doves than any that have had their jaws stretched among us since van amberg's time as for the rhinoceros he deserves especial attention because as the card on his cage informs us he is the unicorn of scripture but he doesn't look a bit like the agile fellow that fought for the crown on his hind legs ah he was an artist for he eats too much hay and nothing can be more absurd and contrary to the revolutionary character of the unicorn dear to heldery than this ironclad monster eating hay with the demureness of a cow still there is danger in his cage the keeper informs us and he ought to know for he probably lived there at some time with him in order to find him out and he further assures us that the reason mr barnum employs him to take care of the beast is that he is an old sailor nobody else being able to go round his horn time however would not suffice to relate the wonders of the yak and the gogana and the wart hog none of which are popular pets nor to tell of the infinite variety of the feline tribe from felis leo himself to the tiniest cougar this collection of animals makes what is called the zoological garden a distinct apartment of the show there is a collection of camels about forty and several elephants eating peanuts with singularly disproportioned taste at the east end and here we observe is the menagerie the camels each with his hump tastefully covered with a camel's hair shawl wait with meek patience for the ring master to call them and they all slide out on their cushioned feet like dusty spectres it would be well to visit the collection of wild animals after this and then inspect the exhibition of animated nature reserving the caravan till the last but the conscientious visitor has the hippodrome the hippohedrons the circus the arena and the ring to inspect and unless he hurries up he will not get through in time we have found in our experience that the best plan is to cut the arena the hippodrome and the hippotheatron and stick to the circus the circus will be found worthy of the carefulest study it will be found to have a largeness that is new and certainly it would be difficult to find more performers or have them do more the rink thanks to barnum is a popular resort we forget how many miles of promenade there are through the zoological department of the menagerie but we know that thousands of people may be seen there of a pleasant afternoon adding a biological interest to the zoological exhibit that is well worth noting the following is from the new york daily standard of december twenty eighth eighteen seventy one unbounded enterprise mr p t barnum is the only man in the show business who thoroughly comprehends the demands of the public 
and is willing to satisfy them at any expenditure of time and means his projects are conceived on a gigantic scale very far in advance of the conservatism so characteristic of even liberal managers his expensive expeditions to labrador some years ago to capture white whales for the american museum and another expedition to south africa in eighteen fifty nine which secured the first and only living hippopotamus ever seen on this continent involved an outlay sufficient to organize and completely furnish a first-class show a third even more hazardous expedition was sent to the north pacific to capture seals sea lions and other marine monsters which were transported thousands of miles in immense water tanks these are but a few in many instances of the large and comprehensive liberality that distinguishes all of mr barnum's enterprises and is the source of his managerial triumphs and the foundation of his financial success obstacles that to others seem insurmountable only spur him on to greater effort no article of real novelty or merit which will enhance the attractions of his exhibitions is suffered to escape for lack of energy or for want of liberal expenditure of money it is this spirit that has enabled mr barnum to combine in one exhibition the most complete and colossal collection of animate and inanimate curiosities ever assembled in the world in the spring of eighteen seventy one when the great show was about to enter upon its first campaign complete as it seemed to the manager and to other experts mr barnum thought a most valuable feature might be added he telegraphed to the whaling ports of new england and sent messages to san francisco and alaska to know if a group of sea lions and other specimens of the phocine tribe could be secured finally through his agents in san francisco he organized an expedition to alaska by the first of july several fine specimens of seals and sea lions some of the latter weighing more than one thousand pounds each were brought in tanks over the union pacific railway were safely landed at bridgeport and thereafter were forwarded to the show then on its travels through new england as these delicate animals are likely to die arrangements have been made to keep good the supply and december sixteenth eighteen seventy one mr barnum received a telegram from san francisco that six more sea lions had just arrived at that port for him two of these will be sent by arrangement to the zoological gardens in regent's park london and the rest with several seals captured in the same expedition will be added to barnum's show next spring mr barnum's active and enterprising agents are in europe asia africa south america and elsewhere in the world wherever anything rare and valuable bird beast reptile or other animate or inanimate curiosity can be secured which will add to the interest of the exhibition in the menagerie and in the hippodrome also experts are constantly engaged in training elephants camels performing horses and other animals and are thus preparing 
new and attractive features some of which will be as novel to the show profession as they will be new and attractive to the public i might fill hundreds of pages with the notices of the new york papers during the protracted exhibition at the empire rink every day almost the journals had something new to say about the show from the simple fact that nearly every day the addition of some new animal or attraction or fresh features in the spring performances compelled new notices the exhibition continued with unabated success and patronage till after the holidays when necessary preparations for the spring campaign including the repainting of all the wagons compelled me to close i must make mention merely of two genuine curiosities from california the one a section of one of the big trees and the other a bright young digger indian who was my guide through the yosemite valley i little thought when i saw the big trees that i should soon secure for exhibition in new york a gigantic section of one of them with the bark which set up as it enclosed the tree enclosed on the one occasion at the empire rink two hundred children from the howard mission the digger was equally a curiosity in his way one day when the baboon escaped from his cage and defied all the efforts of the keepers to capture him my digger indian lassoed him and brought him down with a run and a rope in less than no time his services in and with in this line on other occasions were more memorable i cannot close this additional narrative without warning my readers and the public generally that the enormous success of my great combination has stimulated unscrupulous smaller showmen to feeble imitations which in some instances are and are intended to be downright frauds upon the public nearly every circus and menagerie in the country has lately added what is called a museum and in some cases they have employed a man named or supposed to be named barnum intending to advertise under the title of barnum's show thereby deceiving and swindling the public the trick is very transparent and can be successful if at all only in very rural regions where the newspapers fail to penetrate the so-called museums may embrace a stuffed animal or two and a small show of wax works indeed some of these minor managers have brought cast-off curiosities from me and cheap rubbish from old museums with which to set up the new features in their circuses or menageries the whole public knows that there is but one p t barnum and but one show in the country of sufficient importance to bear his name i trust to my name and my long worked for and well-earned reputation to insure the public against imposition from the attempts of my imitators who are as unprincipled as they will be unsuccessful in their efforts to defraud me and to delude the public end of appendix part four recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c
appendix part five of struggles and triumphs or forty years recollections of p t barnum written by himself this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c struggles and triumphs of p t barnum appendix part five conclusion in sending these last pages to the printer in march eighteen seventy two i may say that my manager mr coop his assistants and myself have been busy ever since new years in reorganizing our great traveling show building new wagons and cages and painting gilding and repairing the others one of the great carved mirrored and gilded chariots from england used by me in eighteen seventy one is a grand affair made telescopic and when extended to its full height reaches an altitude of forty feet on the top of which in our street processions we place a young lady costumed to personate the goddess of liberty the regilding of this one vehicle preparatory to opening our spring campaign cost about five thousand dollars enough to build a nice house in the country the wintering of my horses and wild animals salaries of employees and expense of fitting up properly for the next season cost over fifty thousand dollars during the winter my agents abroad had shipped me many interesting and expensive curiosities indeed ship after ship has brought me so many rare animals and works of art that i have sometimes been puzzled to find places to store them two beautiful giraffes or camelpards were dispatched to me but one died on the atlantic making three of these tender and valuable animals that i have lost within a year the only one on this continent at the, this present writing is mine he is a beauty i own another which is now in the royal zoological gardens regent's park london ready to be shipped at any moment should i unfortunately be obliged to send a message by the atlantic cable announcing the death of my present pet other managers gave up trying to import giraffes several years ago owing to the great cost and care of attending them no giraffe has ever lived two years in america these very impediments however incited me to always have a living giraffe on hand at whatever cost for of course their scarcity enhances their attraction and value as curiosities i hear that my example has stimulated the manager of a small show to try and obtain a giraffe i am educating the public curiosity and taste to demand so much that is rare and valuable that many managers will soon give up the show business as several have this spring while others must be more liberal and enterprising if they succeed hitherto many small showmen who could raise cash and credit to the amount of twenty thousand dollars would get half a dozen cages of cheap animals two or three fourth rate circus riders a few acrobats or tumblers a clown and three or four broken down ring horses then buying some ready printed dashy show bills misrepresenting their show they would announce a great menagerie and circus and perhaps clear the cost of their show the first season for there are some persons who are bound to go to the show whatever may be its merits but the public are generally getting sick of this same old story and as my broadway american museum years ago served to reform or extinguish 
one horse shows so i trust that the immensity of my travelling show will serve to elevate and extend public expectations and improve public exhibitions several immense sea lions and barking seals have also been captured by my agents at alaska and are added to the innumerable caravan some of these marine monsters weigh a thousand pounds each and each consumes from sixty to a hundred pounds of fish per day it is very curious to see them floundering in and out of the immense water tanks in which i transport them through the country their tremendous roar may often be heard the distance of a mile among my equestrian novelties is an italian goat taught in europe to ride on horseback leap through hoops and over banners alighting on his feet on the back of the horse while at full speed i named him alexis in honor of the russian prince he appeared in niblo's gardens new york in february and created much enthusiasm numerous artists in different parts of europe have been engaged all winter in making for my show extraordinary musical and other automatons and moving tableaux so marvelous in their construction as to seem enchanted or to be possessed of life but perhaps the most rare and curious addition to my great show and certainly the most difficult to obtain is a company of four wild fiji cannibals i have tried in vain for years to secure specimens of these man-eaters at last the opportunity came three of these cannibals have fallen into the hands of their royal enemy who was about to execute and perhaps to eat them the missionaries and my agent prevailed upon the copper-colored king to accept a large sum in gold on condition of his majesty's granting them a reprieve and leave of absence to america for three years my agent also leaving a large sum with the american consul to be forfeited if they were not returned within the time stipulated accompanying them is a half-civilized cannibal woman converted and educated by the methodist missionaries she reads fluently and very pleasantly from the bible printed in the fijian language and she already exerts a powerful moral influence over these savages they take a lively interest in hearing her read the history of our saviour they earnestly declare their convictions that eating human flesh is wrong and faithfully promise never again to attempt it they are intelligent and docile their characteristic war dances and rude marches as well as their representations of cannibal manners and customs are peculiarly interesting and instructive it is perhaps needless to add that the bonds for their return will be forfeited they are already learning to speak and read our language and i hope soon to put them in the way of being converted to christianity even if by doing the title of missionary be added to the many already given me by the public the following happy hit is from the pen of rev henry ward beecher as it appeared in that excellent paper of which he is editor the new york christian union of february twenty eighth eighteen seventy two should not a paternal government set some limit to the enterprise of brother barnum with reference at least to the consideration of public safety here upon our desk lies an indication of his last perilous venture he invites us and one friend 
no conditions as to condition specified to a private exhibition of four living cannibals which he has obtained from the fiji islands for his travelling show we have beaten up in this office among the team and tough and those most easily spared in an emergency for volunteers to visit the anthropology and report but never has the retiring and self-distrustful disposition of our employees been more signally displayed this establishment was not represented at that exposition if barnum had remembered to specify the feeding time we might have dropped in in a friendly way at some other period of the day i may add that at the above exhibition several editors brought their daughters those blooming ladies refused to sit on the front seat in the fear of being eaten but i remarked that there was more danger of some of the young gentlemen swallowing them alive than there was from the cannibals the bells subsided and were safe and now comes a joke so huge and ludicrous that i laugh over it daily although there is a serious subject to it every shipment of curiosities that has arrived from abroad this winter has served to put my worthy manager coop in great agony i tell you mr barnum you are getting this show too big has been repeated by my perplexed manager a hundred times since new year's never mind i reply we ought to have a big show the public expect it and will appreciate it so here must go six thousand dollars more for a giraffe wagon and the horses to draw it says coop and this makes more than seventy additional horses that your importations since last fall have rendered necessary well friend coop we have the only giraffe in america i replied yes sir that is all very well but no country can support such an expensive show as you are putting on the road and that is poor coop's doleful complaint continually but now comes a more serious side and here is where the joke comes in i had wintered about five hundred horses and was preparing to add at least another hundred to my retinue i induced my son-in-law mr s h hurd to sell out his business take stock in the show and become its treasurer and assistant manager hurd is clear-headed but he moves cautiously and looks before he leaps on a cold clear morning in february eighteen seventy two mr coop mr hurd and several of our leading assistants and counsellors called at my house their countenances were solemn not to say lugubrious their jaws seemed firmly set and altogether i discovered something ominous in their appearance i saw that there was solid business ahead but i said with a smile gentlemen i am right glad to see you i confess you don't look very jolly but never mind unbosom yourselves and tell me what is up manager coop opened the ball i am very sorry to say mr barnum said that honest good-hearted manager that our business here is important and serious although we of course like to bow to your decisions and are ready to acknowledge that your experience is greater than ours we have had a long and serious consultation this morning and have unanimously concluded 
that your show is more than twice too large to succeed that you will lose nearly four hundred thousand dollars if you try to drag it all through the country that your only chance of success is to sell off more than half of your curiosities and horses and wagons or else divide them into three or certainly two distinct shows is this a mutiny gentlemen i asked with a feeling of countenance far from solemn by no means a mutiny father said hurd but really it is a very serious affair we have been making a careful and close calculation here he drew from his pocket a sheet of paper covered with figures and read from it the expenses of your exhibitions including nearly a thousand men and horses the printing board salaries etc will average more than four thousand dollars per day but call it four thousand you show thirty weeks one hundred and eighty days thus your expenses for the tenting season besides wear and tear and general depreciation will be at least seven hundred and twenty thousand dollars this is about twice as much as any show ever took in one season except your own last year this is the year of the presidential election which on account of political excitement and mass meetings always injures traveling shows we have carefully looked over the towns which you will be able to touch this summer not going west of ohio for you cannot get beyond that state in a single season and we compute your receipts at not over three hundred and fifty thousand dollars which would leave you a loser of three hundred and seventy thousand dollars are you not a little mistaken in some of your estimates i asked mr barnum figures never lie exclaimed mr coop with great earnestness and pulling a pocket map from his breast pocket he opened it and i saw that he was set down for the next spokesman our teams cannot travel with heavy leads more than the average of twenty miles per day continued coop now please follow the lines marked on this map and you will find that we are compelled to make seventy-one stands where there are not people enough within five miles to give us an average of one thousand dollars per day that will involve a loss of two hundred and thirteen thousand dollars and i tell you that taking accidents storms and other risks the season will be ruinous if you don't reduce the show more than one half coop i replied did not thousands of people come fifty sixty a hundred miles last year by railroad excursions to see my show he confessed that they did well i replied if you have lost faith in the discernment of the public i have not and i propose to prove it then laughing heartily i added gentlemen i thank you for your advice but i won't reduce the show a single hair or feather on the contrary i will add five or six hundred dollars per day to my expenses my assembled cabinet rolled their eyes in astonishment father are you crazy asked hurd with a look of despair not much i replied now i continued i see the show is too big to drag from village to village by horse power and i have long suspected it would be and have laid my plans accordingly i will immediately telegraph to all the principal railroad centers between here and omaha nebraska 
and within five days i will tell you what it will cost to transport my whole show taking leaps of a hundred miles or more in a single night so as to hit good-sized towns every day in the season if i can do this with sixty or seventy freight cars six passenger cars and three engines within such a figure as i think it ought to be done for i will do it the cabinet adjourned for five days and it was worth something to see how astonished and apparently pleased the various members looked as they withdrew at the appointed time all met again the railroad telegrams were generally favorable and we then and there resolved to transport the entire museum menagerie and hippodrome all the coming season by rail enlisting a power which if expended on traversing common wagon roads would be equivalent to two thousand men and horses if life and health are spared me till another spring i will report the result of this setting on foot a mighty army with banners but if it is wisely appointed that some other hand shall record it i confidently trust the american public will bear witness that i found great pleasure in contributing to their rational enjoyment end of appendix part five recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c appendix two part one of struggles and triumphs or forty years recollections of p t barnum written by himself this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c struggles and triumphs of p t barnum appendix two part one written up to february eighteen seventy three readers of the preceding pages will expect in this appendix a brief resume of events related to my great travelling world's fair for the season of eighteen seventy two connected as i have been with so many gigantic undertakings and the subject of so many and varied experiences it can hardly be thought strange if i have taught myself not to be surprised at anything in the way of business results the idea of attempting to transport by rail any company or combination requiring sixty-five cars to be moved daily from point to point was an experiment of such magnitude that railroad companies could not supply my demands and i was compelled to purchase and own all the cars up to this time in life my record is clear for never retrograding after one embarking in any undertaking and i did not propose to establish a contrary precedence at this late day so at the appointed time the great combination moved westward by rail the result is known it visited the states of new jersey delaware maryland pennsylvania district of columbia virginia ohio indiana kentucky illinois missouri kansas iowa minnesota wisconsin and michigan in order to exhibit only in large towns it was frequently necessary to travel one hundred miles in a single night arriving in season to give three exhibitions and the usual street pageant at eight o'clock a m by means of cheap 
excursion trains thousands of strangers attended daily from along the lines of the various railroads for a distance of fifty seventy-five and even a hundred miles other thousands came in wagons on horseback and by every means of conveyance that could be pressed into service until by ten o'clock the hour for the morning exhibition the streets sidewalks and stores were filled with strangers it was universally conceded that the money invested by these country customers who took this opportunity to visit the town and make purchases exceeded by many thousands of dollars the amount i took away indeed my own expenditures at each point where we exhibited averaged one half my gross receipts some idea of the excitement throughout the country may be formed from the fact that upon arriving at daylight we usually found wagon loads of rural strangers men women and children who had come in during the night and pitched camp they had arrived at most unseasonable hour for pleasure but this nocturnal experience was no barrier when they had the ultimatum of seeing barnum notwithstanding our transportation was necessarily done at night under all the disadvantages of darkness and usually by three trains it is gratifying to look back upon the great railroad campaign of eighteen seventy two as entirely free from serious accident a few minor casualties occurred at one o'clock in the morning of june eighth several of our cars and cages were precipitated down an embankment at erie pennsylvania by the gross carelessness of a switchman and the utter recklessness of two locomotive engineers the accident resulted in no loss of life but the crushed cages the roaring of the animals the general excitement coupled with the fact that the night was one of egyptian darkness all combined to form an incident of travel long to be remembered it is also a source of satisfaction to record that nothing like riotous conduct quarrelling or disturbing elements of any nature have annoyed us during the tenting season i attribute this to one fact fees that my employees are teetotalers and of gentlemanly behavior that they fully appreciate the wisdom of my forty years motto we study to please and consequently make every effort to preserve decorum and make visitors as happy as possible during the few hours they are with us with wonderful unanimity the public and press acknowledged that i exhibited much more than i advertised and that no combination of exhibitions that ever travelled had shown a tithe of the instructive and amusing novelties that i had gathered together this universal commendation is to me the most gratifying feature of the campaign for not being compelled to do business merely for the sake of profit my highest enjoyment is to delight my patrons the entire six months receipts of the great traveling world's fair exceeded one million dollars the expenses of a hundred and fifty six days were nearly five thousand per day making about seven hundred and eighty thousand dollars besides the interest on a million dollars capital and the wear and tear of the whole establishment although these daily expenses were more than double the receipts of any other show ever organized in my country the financial result surprised every one and even i who had anticipated so much was a little set back when my treasurer made his final report it will be remembered that it was the year of a heated presidential campaign when factional strife and political ambition might 
be expected to monopolize public attention to the serious detriment of amusements generally i think i may with truth say that no other man in america would have dared to assume such risk all well-known showmen agree that without my name which is recognized as a synonym of old reliable always giving my patrons thrice the worth of their money the enormous outlay i incurred would have swamped any other proprietor of this vast collection of novelties requiring the services of one thousand men and three hundred horses the tenting season proper closed at detroit october thirtieth when we were patronized by the largest concourse of people ever assembled in the state of michigan during the season of unparalleled prosperity i made it my custom to be present at all large cities and prominent points and superintend in person the gigantic combination frequently i was invited by leaders in the temperance cause or by the young men's christian associations to lecture on temperance which invitation i accepted when in my power but always upon conditions that the lecture should be free and open to all as a matter of fact i may be permitted to say that upon these occasions more people were turned away than gained admission but whether these crowds were attracted by an interest in the temperance cause or from a desire to get a glimpse of the old showman i have never been fully satisfied my manager and assistants insisted that the latter is true and that my free lectures especially in the large cities resulted to my pecuniary disadvantage as fully satisfying many who otherwise would patronize the exhibition to gratify their curiosity however as our immense pavilions are always crowded i can see no real cause for complaint at my stage of life i confess to a deeper interest in the noble cause of temperance than i ever had in the largest audience ever assembled under canvas if but one half the people who have signed the pledge at these lectures keep it through life i shall feel that my labors in this direction will not have been devoid of valuable and beneficent results early in the presidential canvas i published a general invitation offering the free use of my immense hippodrome pavilion to either of the great political parties for holding mass meetings no building in the west would accommodate the masses seeking admission upon these occasions and open-air gatherings were at a discount even with enthusiastic politicians my immense circus canvas had a seeking had a seating capacity of twelve thousand and was proof against ordinary storms my offer gave the free use of this immense tent between the hours of four and six p m the invitation was accepted in some instances where the exhibition and the political gathering were billed for the same day what when not with the company i spent most of my time at my ideal home waldermere to me who had travelled so far and seen so much and whose life seemed destined to be an eventful one this delight summer retreat is invested with new charms at every successive visit the beautiful groves seem still more beautiful the foliage more green the entire scenery more picturesque and the broad expanse of water with the long island shore visible in the mazy background sparkles in the sunlight with additional brilliancy possibly my affection for waldemere 
is due in some degree to the fact that i can here look upon thriving shade trees and spacious drives of my own creation and that whenever art has beautified nature it has but utilized plans and carried out suggestions of my own in eighteen seventy one i attached to waldemere a new building for a library its architecture was so beautiful and unlike the main edifice that after expending ten thousand dollars on it i was obliged to lay out thirty thousand on the house to make it correspond it was the old story of the man's new sofa over again when the building was enlarged the lawn on the east side appeared to narrow so i purchased a slip of land seven acres on that side for fifty thousand dollars the land is worth it for building lots at present prices but i could not help half agreeing with a neighboring farmer who said well that barnum is the queerest man i ever saw he's gone and spent fifty thousand dollars for a little potato patch to put on his door yard the past season my summer home was made still more attractive by the frequent presence of distinguished personal friends whom i took delight in entertaining their sojourn i endeavored to make agreeable and in after years their recollections of waldemere will i trust be pleasing reminiscences of a quiet visit and unfeigned hospitality in august i received a visit from my esteemed friend the late horace greeley mine was one of the few private residences he visited during the campaign and the last i think which he sought for relaxation or pleasure i have every reason to believe that he spoke the true sentiment of his heart when he assured me of his enjoyment while at my house and never did a careworn journalist and him too the very central figure of a heated political campaign stand more in need of repose and perfect freedom from mental excitement than did mr greeley at this time i arranged an old-fashioned clam bake at which were present congenial spirits from home and abroad mr greeley laid aside all restraint he mingled freely with the guests and his native genial humor and ready wit contributed greatly to the enjoyment the keenest observer could have detected nothing like care or anxiety upon his countenance and the stranger would have pointed him out as a quiet farmer enjoying a day at the seaside although not much of a politician i have my political preferences mr greeley was my lifelong personal friend i gave him my support once i ventured my opinion that his election was doubtful he replied that a more important result than his election would be that running upon so liberal a platform as that adopted at cincinnati would compel all parties to recognize a higher standard regarding public justice and the rights of others my chief concern he added is to do nothing in this canvas that i shall look back upon with an unapproving conscience in october i visited colorado accompanied by my english friend john fish and a bridgeport gentleman who has an interest with me in a stock raising ranch in the southern part of that territory we took the kansas pacific railroad to denver seeing many thousands of wild buffalo our train sometimes being stopped to let them pass the weather was delightful we spent several days in the new and flourishing town of greeley i gave a temperance lecture there also at denver 
at the latter city in the course of my remarks i told them i never saw so many disappointed people as at denver the large audience looked surprised but were relieved when i added half the inhabitants came invalids from the east expecting to die and they find that they cannot do it your charming climate will not permit it and it is a fact i am charmed with colorado the scenery and delightful air and particularly would i recommend as a place of residence to those who can afford it the lively thriving city of denver to those who have their fortunes yet to make i say go to greeley we took the narrow gauge road from denver to pueblo stopping at colorado springs and the garden of the gods the novel scenery here amply paid us for our visit from pueblo i proceeded forty miles by carriage to our cattle ranch and spent a couple of days there very pleasantly we have several thousand head of cattle there which thrive through the winter without hay or fodder of any kind at the close in detroit of the great western railroad tour i equipped and started south a museum menagerie and circus which while it made no perceptible diminution in the main body was still the largest and most complete traveling expedition ever seen in the southern states louisville was designated as the rendezvous and point of consolidation of the various departments and the new expedition gave its initial exhibition in the fall city november fourth much of the menagerie consisted of animals of which i owned the duplicate and hence could easily spare them without injuring the variety in my zoological collection i was aware also that many of the rare specimens would thrive better in a warmer climate and as the expense of procuring them had been enormous i coupled my humanitarian feelings with my pecuniary interest and sent them south end of appendix two part one recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c appendix two part two of struggles and triumphs or forty years recollections of p t barnum written by himself this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Struggles and Triumphs of P.T. Barnum, Appendix 2, Part 2, written up to February 1873 and now in this routine of events for eighteen seventy two i record one important project with mingled feelings of pleasure and pain in august i purchased of mr l b lent the building and lease in fourteenth street new york known as the hippotheatron one purpose was to open a museum menagerie and hippodrome that would give employment to two hundred of my people who would otherwise be idle during the winter another and main object was to take the inaugural steps toward the foundation of a permanent establishment where the higher order of arnic entertainments could be witnessed under all the advantages of a thoroughly equipped refined and moral dramatic entertainment my project combined not only a circus but a museum of the world's wonders and a menagerie that could equal in extent and variety the great zoological collection of london i realized the importance of an establishment in new york where old and young could seek innocent amusement 
and where christian parents could take their children and feel that the exhibition contributed not only to their enjoyment but to their instruction the press generally had kindly acknowledged the success of my efforts in bringing the modern arena up to its proper standard among the fashionable amusements of the day by divesting the ring of all objectionable features and securing the highest talent of both hemispheres my circus had become popularized among the better classes for whose good opinion it had ever been my fortune to cater at an expense of sixty thousand dollars i enlarged and remodeled the building so as to admit my valuable collection of animals museum of life-size automatons and living curiosities the entire edifice was so thoroughly built over as to leave but little to remind the visitor of its original structure the amphitheatre had a seating capacity of twenty eight hundred it consisted of a parquet and balcony each completely encircling the ring and the former luxuriously fitted up with cushioned armchairs and sofa seats the grand opening took place monday evening november eighteenth in theatrical parlance the house was crowded from pit to dome the leading citizens of the metropolis were present many of whom on that occasion patronized an equestrian entertainment for the first time viewed from the centre of the ring the vast amphitheatre presented a scene of bewildering beauty the dazzling lights the delightful music of the orchestra the gorgeous surroundings and the brilliant audience filled the numerous circles of seats which rose one above another to the most remote outskirts of the building all formed a picture so unlike anything ever before seen in new york as to bring out detailed and eucalyptic editorials from the press of the following morning being recognized among the audience i was called into the ring when i briefly thanked my friends for their generous appreciation from this date the establishment was open daily from eleven a m to ten p m with hippodrome performances afternoon and evening on december sixteenth four weeks after the inauguration of the new fourteenth street building i started for new orleans to visit my southern show i found the crescent city luxuriating in its usual winter rains and paddling through its regular rations of mud and slush happy in its very dreariness the contentment of the native population of new orleans reaches the sublime the average citizen accepts rain and its kindred elements as special attractions indigenous to that climate and unless the levee breaks and the turbulent mississippi overflows the city they see no occasion to murmur during the brief intervals of sunshine i rode through the principal streets met several old acquaintances and renewed friendships formed many years ago changes i found it is true but they are changes resulting from nature rather than from human hands the ravages of time and natural decay seem to offset all the thrift of which new orleans can boast no northerner no matter how frequent he visits fulfills his destiny until he drives to the suburbs and plucks his fill of oranges upon the occasion of my visit political dissensions monopolized public attention what with the continual skirmishing between the municipal state and general governments the city was in a most disagreeable turmoil and one retired at night quite uncertain as to what administration would be in power in the morning once i had occasion to inquire for the governor's address and my companion innocently asked 
which one compared to the civic and military imbroglio in new orleans in december the political situation of mexico was one of placid serenity it was while quietly seated at the breakfast table at the st louis hotel in the crescent city on tuesday december twenty fourth that the waiter handed me a telegram i had been reading in the morning papers of the flooding of my showgrounds on canal street and of the change of location my manager had been forced to make these annoyances had prepared me when i read the dispatch to fully appreciate longfellow's words so disasters come not singly it was as follows new york december twenty fourth to p t barnum new orleans about four a m fire discovered in the boiler room of circus building everything destroyed except two elephants one camel s h hurd treasurer calling for pen ink and paper i then and there cabled my european agents to send duplicates of all animals lost with positive instructions to have everything shipped in season to reach new york by the middle of march they were further directed to procure at any cost specimens never seen in america and through sub-agents to purchase and forward curiosities animate and inanimate from all parts of the globe cable dispatches were also sent to the celebrated inventors and manufacturers of automons in paris to lose no time in making and purchasing everything new and wonderful in the way of mechanical effects this feature of my great exhibition had proved so attractive that i determined at once not only to duplicate it but to enlarge this department to double its original size i then dispatched the following to my son-in-law new orleans december twenty fourth to s h hurd new york tell editors i have cabled european agents to expend half million dollars for extra attractions will have new and more attractive travelling show than ever early in april p t barnum these details attended to i could see no further occasion for delaying breakfast and taking a calm view of the situation the total destruction of this beautiful building and its valuable contents was an item of news for which i was ill prepared and the extent of which calamity i could scarcely comprehend i could realize in a measure of vast conflagration with its excitement and contingent incidents but i could not think without a shudder of the terrible sufferings of one hundred wild beasts in their frantic howling efforts to escape the flames for a moment i was disposed to censure my agents and employees for permitting such a wholesale destruction of these poor animals then i remembered the reliable men i employed and could not but feel assured that everything in their power had been done the four beautiful giraffes the only ones in the united states and which alone cost eighty thousand dollars were lost in the general sacrifice i learned afterwards that every effort was made to rescue them but the poor innocent pets were utterly paralyzed with fear and could not be made to move even after the lattice enclosure had been torn away had they escaped the burning building the terrible cold night would doubtless have killed them before they could have been sheltered from the weather no pecuniary compensation could satisfy me for the loss of these and many other rare animals returning to new york i learned that my loss on building and property amounted to the neighborhood of three hundred thousand dollars to meet this i held insurance policies to the amount of ninety thousand dollars 
my equestrian company in which i took great pride and which i had hoped to give employment during the winter was of course left idle until the opening of the summer season the members lost their entire wardrobe a loss of which can only be appreciated by professionals i was pleased to see a disposition manifested to render them some assistance and encouraged it so far as lay in my power a benefit was arranged under the auspices of the equestrian benevolent association of the united states the order has for its object the relief of unfortunate members and as in the present case its broad mantle of charity includes worthy professionals not members of the association the affair came off at the academy of music tuesday january seventh eighteen seventy three afternoon and evening many stars in the equestrian dramatic and musical firmament volunteered for the occasion and the two entertainments were largely attended being called upon to define my position i stepped upon the stage and made a few off-hand remarks which were reported in the morning papers as follows ladies and gentlemen i have catered for so many years for the amusement of the public the beneficiaries on this occasion seem to have thought that the showman himself ought to be part of the show and at their request i come before you i sincerely thank you in their behalf for your patronage on this occasion how much they need your substantial sympathy the ashes across the street can tell you more eloquently than human tongue could utter these ashes are the remnants of the all the worldly goods of some who appeal to you to-day for myself i have been burned out so often i am like the singer who was hissed on the stage hiss away said he i am used to it my pecuniary loss is very serious and occurring as it did just before the holidays it is all the more disastrous it may perhaps gratify my friends to know however that i am still enabled to invest another half million dollars without disturbing my bank account the public will have amusements and they ought to be those of elevating and an objectionable character for many years it has been my pleasure to provide a class of instructive and amusing entertainments to which a refined christian mother can take her children with satisfaction i believe that no other man in america possesses the desires and facilities which i have in this direction i have therefore taken steps through all my agents in europe and this country which will enable me to put upon the road early in april the most gigantic and complete travelling museum menagerie and hippodrome ever organized it has been asked whether i will build up a large museum and menagerie in new york well i am now nearly sixty-three years of age i can buy plenty of building sites and get plenty of leased lots for a new museum but i cannot get a new lease of life younger members of my family desire me to erect in this city an establishment worthy of new york and of myself it will be no small undertaking for if i erect such an establishment it will possess novel and costly features never before attempted i have it under consideration and within a month shall determine whether or not i shall make another attempt of one thing however you may be assured ladies and gentlemen although conflagrations may for the present disconcert my plans yet while i have life and health no fire can burn no water quench my ambition to gratify my patrons at whatever cost of money 
or of effort i shall never lend my name where my labors and heart do not go with it and the public shall never fail to find at any of my exhibitions their money's worth ten times told the following paragraph from the new york tribune of january sixteenth eighteen seventy three will give an inkling of what i am about as i send these last pages to press barnum and the automaton talker mr phineas t barnum the genial showman contributes a good deal to our amusement and all new yorkers have a kindly side for him here is the philadelphia press's account of his latest achievement early yesterday morning professor faber received a call at the de Girard house from a renowned showman p t barnum who is now on a visit to philadelphia in pursuit of wonders for his great travelling show within two hours professor faber had given notice to the emperor of austria of his forfeiture of two hundred pounds for not exhibiting his talking machine at the vienna exposition next summer and a contract was signed by mr barnum agreeing to pay twenty thousand dollars for the services of mr and mrs faber and their wonderful ottoman talker during the tenting season of eighteen seventy three no more marvellous exhibition was ever seen in a travelling tent it is the most wonderful achievement of ingenuity that this age of new invention has yet witnessed although it looks no more like a talking machine than an old-fashioned weaver's loom or a modern sewing machine it converses plainly and distinctly in all languages giving every intonation of the human voice to extraordinary perfection mr barnum says that ten million of visitors will hear this wonderful wooden conversationalist during the coming summer it is amusing to witness the difference in men's dispositions i arrived in new york from new orleans on the night before new year's just a week after the fire i found my manager mr coop and my son-in-law mr hurd in rather low spirits i laughed at them and called them my deacons but begged them not to go into mourning it is astonishing how you can laugh when you know our museum building and all of our rare animals are burned up and we cannot get more in time for the spring show drawled the lubrious coop in an injured tone if the fire had waited ten days till the holidays were over we should have been fifty thousand dollars better off chimed in the chopfallen herd if the skies had fallen we should have caught larks i replied but as the skies did not fall let us be content with what is still left us as for you coop i continued you talk about what we cannot do now have i not told you often enough the word can't is not in my dictionary but you can't help the fire can you retorted coop i shall not try but i can restore all it has destroyed and much more i replied and i will do it within three months at furthest that is easier said than done responded coop with a sigh surely father you don't think we can get a new show upon the road before july do you asked mr hurd i repeat that i see nothing to prevent our exhibiting the largest and best show on this earth three months from to-day i replied all that is required are energy pluck courage and a liberal outlay of money all our golden chariots and cages our horses harnesses canvas tents and wagons are saved besides which we have thirty new cages nearly finished 
telegraphs atlantic cables and our agents abroad can supply us all the curiosities and animals we want before the last of march next if we will supply them with money enough but my advisers thought i was too sanguine and they said as much coop even proposed to lie still a year and start our show again in eighteen seventy four but i replied that my years were too few and too precious to be wasted in that way and although i would never put a show upon the road that did not exceed in magnitude and merit that which we had lost i felt every confidence in accomplishing this before april if we would all work hard strange enough before we parted on the evening of december thirty first i received a cable message from my trusty agent robert fillingham of london saying he had purchased for me a pair of giraffes or camel leopards and a full supply of lions tigers and other animals he added all the governmental zoological gardens here and on the continent sympathize with you and are ready to dispose of any animals you wish the mechanicisms of paris and geneva are at work on automatons and other attractions for your travelling museum don't let that electricity beat the world exclaimed mr coop with great delight just put a little of it into your blood i replied and we will beat the world the spirits of my associates were thoroughly revived and at this present writing on the twentieth day of february i have already received more rare wild animals and other curiosities than i ever had before at one time with promise of many more within a month and mrs hurd and coop are in high feather mr barnum said coop this morning this new show of ours got up in so short a time is the miracle of the age well my dear fellow i replied the public like miracles keep performing them and you are sure of success you can never do so much for the public but they will do more for you in return give them the best show possible at whatever cost keep it free from objectionable features and never fear your efforts will surely be appreciated and you will receive a generous support remember excelsior is our motto these are the feelings which inspire us as we energetically prepare for our third campaign and although i see plenty of hard work ahead i also see bright skies smiling faces and assured success Fini. in concluding this brief resume of the last year's events i would seem ungrateful did i fail to acknowledge my heartfelt thankfulness to the public and the press for the generous and unqualified expressions of sympathy on account of the great calamity of december twenty fourth editors throughout the united states and europe have written of this conflagration and of those which preceded it and have attributed to me a degree of perseverance i fear beyond my deserts if the fiery ordeal has had any visible effect it had been to increase my desire to identify my name with a class of entertainment at once moral amusing and instructive colossal as was the great travelling world's fair of eighteen seventy two that of eighteen seventy three will surpass it with full confidence in just discrimination will recognizes and rewards true merit i remain as ever the public's obedient servant p t b february eighteen seventy three end of appendix two part two recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c end of struggles and triumphs 
or forty years recollections of p t barnum written by himself